Hey, no problem. I thought we were too. The committee will come to order. Thank you for being with us today with this hearing to focus on innovation and some of the biggest roadblocks. We can all agree that America is a global leader of innovation and the government should do everything it can to foster an environment that prom promotes greater innovation and patient access to innovative care. Unfortunately, we have all seen the news about recent examples of government getting in the way. CMS restrictive coverage mandate for new promising Alzheimer's treatment, repealing the Trump uh, admin uh, rule with no replacement still, CMMI considering changes to cover for Part B drugs that receive FDA accelerated approval, USTR's TRIPS waiver of critical IP protection for COVID uh, vaccine, and the so-called government negotiation of drug prices implemented under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. In fact, just last week, data was released on a third promising Alzheimer's drug showing it significantly slows the uh, progression of the disease, but it'll still be a subject for current restrictive CMA uh, mandates. The landscape has changed since uh, June 2021. The Alaham was approved by uh, CMS refuses to consider the coverage, despite evidence showing they're very effective in treating Alzheimer's in its early stages. This is a progressive, and 6.7 million Americans living with it don't have time to wait on CMS to come to its senses. This delay means uh, many things to a lot of the different patients, and it's, it's been a big challenge. In fact, in April 26, bipartisan attorney general across the 26 attorney generals across the country sent a letter to Secretary Butchera, uh and the administration on CMS to consider uh, a requirement for covering these drugs, and I'm submitting this letter for the record today. As someone who has firsthand uh, been devastated in terms of the impact in terms of Alzheimer's, my own father, uh, and because I'm one of the oldest districts in the country, this issue is personal and important to me. In fact, in the effort to push CMS to do their job the right way, I introduced the Bipartisan Merit Act earlier this year to require CMS to consider each new drug on its own rather than uh, as a class. FDA approval, whether traditional or accelerated, is a full approval, and CMS should not be second-guessing the scientists uh, at FDA who granted the approval in the first place. Additionally, as a former ranking member of the Trade Subcommittee, the TRIPS waiver for COVID vaccine is a particular concern to me given it directly undermines the mission of the USTR to vigorously protect Americans' interests abroad, including protecting intellectual property rights. I have led multiple uh, letters signed by the House, my House colleagues opposing the TRIPS waiver because there is no reason to continue pursuing such a waiver. It will be only our adversaries to access uh, critical IP that they have no other uh, possession. The pandemic is over. The public health emergency ends tomorrow, and, and we uh, have an abundance of vaccine doses that are available for people in the furthest, farthest reaches of the earth. Unfortunately, the physical infrastructure doesn't exist to get the doses to those people instead of giving away our IP to other countries. We should be helping to teach them how to best to update uh, their outdated infrastructure. If we continue down this path of, of working against innovators, we will start falling behind countries like China that are willing to do whatever they can to pass us by. Finally, I want to mention CMMI because despite having innovation in its name, it's one of the, the greatest barriers to, act, to actual innovation in healthcare. Since 2010, CMMI has released many demonstration projects, some of which were mandatory, but has not realized savings greater than the amount of the money Congress has spent on, on the agency. We, we all want Medicare and Medicaid to run efficiently, but it's time that Congress reasserts its control over these decisions and works to truly help promote American innovation. There is bipartisan interest in many of these topics we're going to talk about today, and we should find bipartisan solutions to them. I'm in the business 
personally of trying to get to yes with my colleagues. So I'd like to challenge my friends on the other side of the aisle to work with us on a way to unleash American innovation. We all want America to lead the world in medical innovation, and we want America to have access to the newest, best groundbreaking treatments as soon as possible. I hope we can leave this hearing today with a renewed sense of bipartisanship and willingness to work together on policies that protect and enhance innovation. I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly share those objectives with you. And I want to sincerely thank you personally for reaching out to me last week regarding the CMS demonstration project. Uh, I uh, think that you're known for seeking bipartisan action, and I hope that we can do that as much as possible in this committee. Unfortunately, on this first hearing regarding payment for drugs subject to accelerated approval and related issues, I do have some significant policy differences with you regarding how to assure access to innovative new drugs without paying monopoly prices. Twenty years ago, in this room, the Medicare Prescription Drug Program was narrowly forced through the Ways and Means Committee, and then it took an almost all-night session and a lot of arm twisting to get enough Republicans to vote for it to pass it in the House and make it law. With one notable line in that very lengthy bill, Big Pharma ensured it would retain monopoly power and the ability to charge the very highest prices in the world through a complete prohibition against any negotiation over drug prices by Medicare. Finally, last year, Democrats provided a very narrow carve-out to eventually allow negotiation on a very small number of drugs that offers no hope of lower prices to most Americans. So extremely narrow and restrictive was that carve-out that the financial services firm Raymond James said, quote, pharma's CEOs are likely popping champagne and smoking cigars, end quote, yet unwilling to yield even this smallest sliver of monopoly power, Big Pharma promotes scare tactics that insist we cannot have both reasonable prices and essential innovation. All of us want to encourage cures and treatments for dreaded diseases long before we or a loved one face a troubling diagnosis. Despite its overly generous tax incentive, its taxpayer-funded research, its monopoly profits, Big Pharma, I believe, has actually been doing far, far too little to secure the type of new medications which we all would like to see. Seldom worried about a competitor with a better idea, monopolies and oligopolies are not known in any industry for being particularly innovative. Over a decade, 78% of new drug patents were not for new cures that we need, but were small modifications to existing drugs designed simply to extend monopoly power and monopoly prices. Among the 10 top-selling drugs in this country, 66% of the patent applications were filed after FDA approval, and an average of 74 patents were granted on each drug. And while there are pathways intended to get innovative drugs and devices to market quickly, the FDA's accelerated approval program and the medical device breakthrough program, I believe, are deeply flawed. In fact, the data is out there, and about 40 percent of all drugs that are granted accelerated approval fail to complete uh, the, their confirmatory clinical trials after coming to market as is required uh, by law. Those trials are critical to ensuring drugs have a clinical benefit and meet all safety requirements. Similarly, in its first three years, the FDA granted a remarkable 222 devices as breakthrough designations. Despite poorly designed studies that did not demonstrate real benefit on many of these devices, and some safety studies that showed substantial risk to patients. I've long been concerned with medical device safety, and it is apparent that the FDA has increasingly become a captive of those that it is charged with regulating. It has not been forceful enough or creative enough early enough to protect patient safety. At a bare minimum, physicians ought to be required to report device safety issues, and the FDA ought to provide unique device identification numbers as I've urged it to do in the past, so we can remove faulty devices from the market very quickly. Despite these many significant concerns, 
our Republican colleagues would have taxpayers pay monopoly prices for questionable drugs and devices. Such thinking has fueled our flawed patent system and reimbursement system, which actually disincentivizes innovation. With a government granted monopoly and guaranteed Medicare coverage, it's much easier to tweak and repackage existing drugs rather than to develop the new cures that we need. And while Big Pharma may claim that billions that they earn on these drugs are devoted to research and development and new cures, the reality is that manufacturers are spending more on marketing and propaganda than R&D, more on stock buy buybacks and dividends than R&D. The real angel investors in research and development for new cures in, Americans, in America are none other than American taxpayers. Over the last decade, every single newly approved drug relied on taxpayer-funded research and taxpayers funded the majority of total research and development spending. U.S. taxpayers remain the largest source of R&D funding in the entire world. Yet American patients continue to face the very highest prices, forcing them to ration or skip necessary medications altogether. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we have a responsibility to ensure that patients come first and that it is their health and their livelihoods, not drug prices, which must be non-negotiable. Unaffordability and inaccessibility are not the unavoidable side effects of innovation. They are the result of unrestrained monopoly power. I thank each of our witnesses with differing views for joining us today to examine that monopoly power and I hope that moving forward, we will not once again yield to the power of Big Pharma, instead move to advance reasonable solutions that promote competition and achieve lower prices. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. I'm pleased to recognize the Chairman of Ways and Means Committee, Chairman Smith, for his opening statement. Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Doggett, is a, it's a pleasure to be with you once again. Um, and, and I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. I, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts on, on how current White House policies are, are threatening medical innovation and patient access to care. Across America, millions of patients are anxiously hoping for new breakthrough cures and devices that will improve their quality of life or even give them more years with their loved ones. The scientists that research these cures, they rely on Congress to craft policies that support innovation. Patients deserve peace of mind that these therapies will be available to them when approved. Poor policymaking through both Congress and executive action, however, can have a chilling effect on the development of and access to the next drug, next device or treatment. Unfortunately, that is what we are seeing today with decisions made by agencies such as CMS. Broadly restricting coverage for Alzheimer's treatments, the first approved in nearly 20 years, is a devastating blow to the patients and caregivers relying on new innovations. Importantly, these restrictions are disproportionately felt by those living in rural America who don't have access to qualifying clinical trials. I applaud Subcommittee Chairman Buchanan's work on this issue, and I hope that in the light of continued positive data, such as the study released last week, CMS will reconsider this decision. I also have concerns that the CMS Innovation Center's proposed policy to devalue accelerated approved drugs will slow access to breakthrough innovation, such as many cancer therapies. Congress shares much of the blame too. The Inflation Reduction Act established a new drug price control scheme. We all want to make medications more affordable, but making Washington the price setter will only lead to fewer cures and less access to them. Experts warn that price controls will lead to 135 fewer cures and discourage the development of generic and biosimilar competition, a far more patient-friendly approach for lowering drug prices. Patients relying on breakthrough medical devices are also facing uncertainty. After a Trump era, innovative coverage role was repealed by the, administ by the administration. I know members on both sides of the aisle will be closely watching for a meaningful replacement. 
Lastly, the Biden administration's decision to waive IP protections for vaccines and potentially expand the therapeutics and diagnostics is setting a very dangerous precedent and opening the door for countries like China to steal our innovation. Right now, there are 322 different medicines being developed to treat cancer, 192 for rare genetic diseases, 83 for Alzheimer's disease, and hundreds of others. Patients cannot afford Washington's anti-innovation policies. I look forward to working with all my Ways and Means colleagues, both Republican and Democrat, to promote access to these future cures. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, now, I now want to introduce the witnesses. Mr. Gonzalez is a national early stage advisor for Alzheimer's Association. And I personally want to thank you for your courage in taking the time to be with us today. Mr. Ocon is the executive director of Community Oncology Alliance. Dr. La, whatever, I'm sorry, is professor of the pharmaceutical, economic, and public policy at the University of South, uh, Southern California. Mr. Macauer, uh, Dr. Macauer is the director of Stanford University VR Center for Biodesign. Mr. Kasaham is a, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. The, the committee has received your written statements and will be part of the formal uh, record. Mr. Gonzalez, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Doggett, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and share my story about what access to innovation means to me. It means more time with my wife, my kids, and my grandson. My name is Tony Gonzalez. I am 48 years old from Santa Maria, California, and last year I was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. I know this disease can destroy careers, relationships, and every day it robs me more and more of my memories. A few years ago, my family and I noticed the first few signs that something was wrong. Then one day I got lost coming home from work. I was in my hometown, I was in my car, on a road that I had driven thousands of times, and I had no idea where I was. I had no idea where I'd been or where I was going. All I knew was I needed to call my wife for help. I spent the next couple of years, couple of years, searching for an answer. Two years after my initial symptoms, I finally received a diagnosis, mild cognitive impairment. When I was diagnosed, it would have given me so much hope to have the opportunity to access treatments that can give me more time. I'd like to have the chance to make the decision if the treatments are right for me and my family, instead of Medicare making that decision for me. I became a member of the Alzheimer's Association Early Stage Advisory Group to help raise awareness of this disease, especially for those people who are under 65 and not typically the face of the Alzheimer's disease. When I'm in a meeting and someone tells me they've never met someone with dementia, I say to them, well, now you have. You see, I want people to see the impact of this disease that it has on real people and real families in America. The incredible bipartisan support for increases in Alzheimer's research, funding at the NIH over the years, are starting to pay off. In the last year and a half, we've seen two treatments get FDA approval and another one that we'll submit to the FDA soon. These treatments have the ability to change the course of this disease. The fact that they exist and are approved by the FDA, and yet people like me cannot access them because of Medicare is frustrating and humiliating. As many of you know, CMS is restricting access to, break, to these breakthrough therapies by creating additional hoops to jump through. This creates even more of a barrier to care for people living in rural and underserved communities like those in my hometown. Medicare is treating people with MCI and Alzheimer's differently when they apply the, this restriction to an entire class of drugs, current and future. This action has a ripple effect as well. Private insurance 
and health systems follow Medicare's lead. If Medicare won't cover, chances are that other insurances won't either, and health systems won't make it available. Thus, taking more time away from people, including for me and others who aren't on Medicare. This is an urgent issue. The Alzheimer's Association estimates more than 2,000 individuals age 65 or older transition per day outside eligibility for these treatments. As of today, that number is approximately 248,000 people who have progressed past the point of eligibility since approval in January. Keep in mind, this number doesn't even include people like me who are under 65. Earlier this year, Nearly 100 bipartisan members of Congress, including many on this subcommittee, sent letters to the administration, raising concerns with CMS's coverage policies around these FDA-approved Alzheimer's treatment. Thank you. As recently as last week, another company announced positive top-line results for their new Alzheimer's treatment. This innovation will mean nothing without access. CMS must immediately reconsider. They must look at the clear evidence now before them, and when they do, I trust they will acknowledge that these treatments are absolutely reasonable and necessary for people like me with a terrible progressive disease and no other treatment options. Refusing to take another look at NCD further expands the divide between CMS and the Alzheimer's community. We're losing time, and this is unacceptable. More time is more than just a number of months or years that I may gain from such treatments. I wake up every day hoping to know who I am, who my wife is, who my kids are. When I wake up and I realize that, it's a win. So I live for today. I want more time to be with my grandson, Sandy, take him to the park and to be able to do that on my own. I don't drive anymore, but I can still hang out with him and spend time with him. You see, when you get a death diagnosis, it becomes very clear to you. Having more time means everything to me. It would allow me to walk my daughter down the aisle, meet another grandchild. It gives me another chance at living my best every single day. Time to live again, time to hope again. It truly is an honor to speak with you today and share my story. I hope it inspires all of you to continue your work, urging CMS to treat those with Alzheimer's fairly. And lastly, I hope you remember to live for today. Love those around you. I wish you all good brain health and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, it was very inspiring. Mr. Olkan, you are recognized. Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Doggett, and members of the Health mm -hmm. Subcommittee, I am the Executive Director of the Community Oncology Alliance, a nonprofit organization dedicated to cancer patients and their independent oncology providers. My wife, Susan, practiced as an oncology nurse for 10 years and we have had family and friends with cancer living with it and dying from the disease. I want to make it very clear that my overriding goal is to ensure that every American with cancer, regardless of demographic, financial, or other status, has access to the highest quality, most affordable cancer care close to home. I also add that both my wife and I are Medicare beneficiaries. I am alarmed at the rising cost of drug, cancer drugs. Clearly, drug companies have primary responsibility because they determine the launch and subsequent list prices of prescription drugs. However, our country has a bizarre, convoluted health system where the price of drugs and the cost of patients are two very different and often disjointed things, with drug costs to Americans fueled by intermediaries like PBMs, and so-called nonprofit 340B hospitals. As Dr. Mark Fendrick of the University of Michigan and creator of value-based insurance design has often lectured me, when Americans talk about the high price of drugs, they are really referring to the high cost to them of what they pay out of pocket. 
Our nation has made great strides in cancer treatment, especially with the increasing availability of immunotherapies. As I was preparing my testimony, an oncologist called me about a 35-year-old woman who had recurring gastrointestinal esophageal and brain cancer since she was 18 years old. Six months ago, she developed a cancer in the small bowel that spread to her other organs. She was put on a treatment regimen, including immunotherapy. After four months, she is in complete remission. My wife calls these immunotherapies nothing short of revolutionary, as she has seen firsthand in administering them. We must not only ensure that all Americans with cancer have access to these innovative, cutting-edge therapies, but also that we foster their development. That's why I'm concerned that our already overregulated healthcare system is getting even more regulated by the government. As I explain in more depth in my written testimony, there is a fundamental lack of understanding of the life cycle of cancer drugs, how uses in different types of cancers and subcancers are researched and developed over time after a drug is first approved by the FDA, sometimes for a single indication. Certainly drug companies won't stop researching new innovative drugs due to the IRA because that is their lifeblood. However, the threat of government negotiations will be a huge obstacle to research and developing new uses in different types of cancers over time. Ask yourself if you would invest research funds in new uses of cancer drugs with a looming threat of price cutting by government negotiation. How CMS figures out how to negotiate the single price for a drug with multiple indications, value, and therapeutic competition is nearly impossible. This also is truly alarming, especially since I believe that the threat of drug price negotiations will simply fuel drug launch prices higher. The unintended consequence of the law meant to lower drug prices may actually increase them. Additionally, both the IRA and the President's recent executive order using the CMS Innovation Center to lower drug prices in certain situations of accelerated drug approvals uses physicians as variable hostages between the government and drug companies. Physicians will feel the brunt of lower drug reimbursement and an operational nightmare of dual reimbursement systems in the case of the IRA. Poor public policy, dare I utter the word sequestration, and regulation have already caused massive consolidation of independent physicians and expensive mega health systems, costing patients, Medicare, employees, and taxpayers more for drugs and medical care. And let me explain that the CMS Innovation Center, rather than being a testing center to innovate payment reform, has become a vehicle for now three administrations to attempt to lower drug prices by end running the Congress and existing law. This was not the intent of Congress in creating the CMS Innovation Center. I fear we are heading down a dark path in this country where innovation is stifled, consolidation fuels increasing health care costs, and Americans have less access to the medical providers of their choice. Like with cancer treatment, we just can't treat the symptoms of our health care system by band-aiding it with regulation upon regulation. We need to treat the underlying disease, which includes runaway hospital consolidation, profiteering middlemen, and obstacles to fostering true drug competition. Every American with cancer and other serious diseases is counting on us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I will answer any questions. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Lakdawalla, you are recognized. I tried. I'm trying to get a little bit better. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Doggett, and honorable members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the impact of federal policy on medical innovation. My name is Darius Lakdawalla, and I'm an economist, a professor at the USC Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and Price School of Public Policy, and the Director of Research at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. As background, I've been studying medical innovation for nearly three decades, and I co-wrote the chapter on biomedical research in the Handbook of Health Economics. The opinions I offer today are my own and don't represent those of the University of Southern California or the USC Schaefer Center. Over the last 50 years, medical breakthroughs have lessened the scourge of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and many other conditions. Researchers have estimated that longer lives provided annual value equal to half of GDP. The question is, how can we sustain the pace of technological innovation while ensuring patients have access to new technologies? 
Medical innovation is costly to pursue. 90% of medicines that undergo human trials will fail to launch. Firms will pursue risky innovations only if they expect commensurate financial rewards, which are ultimately paid by American consumers. This trade-off between innovation incentives and patient access is often framed as an either-or proposition. Either we reward innovators with high prices, or we restrict prices to make new therapies more accessible. For example, in the early days of Part D, our research estimated Medicare price negotiation could lower drug prices by 20 to 25 percent. But the resulting innovation slowdown would cost future Americans about half a year of life expectancy. Though it sounds modest, this is equivalent to every surgeon in America forgetting how to perform heart bypass surgery. Fortunately, there are solutions. Our study also demonstrated that expanding prescription drug coverage is worth the cost because it simultaneously rewards innovators and makes innovation more accessible. Today's drug prices determine tomorrow's drug launches. Research suggests that every $2.5 billion of revenue removed from a drug class costs society one new drug approval. For every legislated reduction in Medicare drug prices, as the Inflation Reduction Act promises, we will lose future treatments. To lessen this risk, we should pursue a more surgical approach to restraining prices. Rewards should be lower for technologies producing less value to patients, but higher for those producing more. Measuring the value of new medicines is hard, but we have the tools to do it properly. Old-fashioned methods like quality-adjusted life years, or qualies, fail to measure value to patients properly. A new method called Generalized Risk-Adjusted Cost-Effectiveness, or GRACE, corrects these errors and does not discriminate against patients with disability or terminal illness, as older methods do. The IRA provides an opportunity to better align price and value for individual drugs, but only if CMS employs evidence-based and scientifically validated methods for measuring value to patients. To align prices and value, USC Schaefer Center researchers have proposed a different model, starting with lower drug prices at launch, and encouraging uptake for clinically eligible patients and accelerating real-world evidence collection. Subsequently, drug prices would change according to evidence-based real-world benefit. Finally, robust generic or biosimilar competition would drive down prices when the drug's exclusivity period ends. Innovative drug pricing policies like these require careful implementation. CMMI's efforts to develop new payment mechanisms for drugs launched under accelerated approval are a potential path forward, but success depends on payments that accurately reflect value to patients. Policy precedents exist for the controlled launch of new technologies, such as CMS's coverage with evidence development paradigm. However, under CED as currently implemented, many technologies still languish even after years of restricted access. While CMS has a legitimate interest in evaluating real-world evidence on medical necessity, restricting access undermines CED's original evidence-gathering goal. Other reforms are needed. IRA inflation rebates and several other Part D program features encourage higher, not lower, launch prices. And by reducing prices for established branded drugs, IRA discourages generic entrants by lowering their rewards from challenging patents. By ensuring generous prescription drug insurance, drug prices that reflect the value they deliver to patients, and effective competition throughout the pharmaceutical supply chain, we can achieve improved health for Americans today and also for Americans tomorrow. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mackauer. You are now rec recognized. Thank you, Chairman Buchanan and Ranking Member Dodgett for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Josh Mackauer, and I've dedicated the past 34 years of my life to developing therapies and technologies to improve patient care. Over this time, I've founded 10 independent medical device companies which collectively have improved the lives of millions and created thousands of jobs in the United States. In addition to being a physician inventor and entrepreneur at Stanford University, where I'm a professor of medicine and bioengineering, I'm also the co-founder and director of the Stanford Byers Center for Biodesign. For 22 years, we've been teaching students, fellows, and faculty the process of medical innovation, and innovations our students have created have touched the lives of 8 million patients to date. My opinions in my testimony today are my own and do not represent the opinions of the organizations I'm affiliated with. I'm here today because of a growing concern that threatens our ability to continue to deliver the improvements to health outcomes innovators like myself have worked so hard to achieve over the years. 
Increasingly, medical technology innovators are confronting a valley of death where their technologies have received FDA authorization, but no CMS or insurance coverage is in place to allow patients to gain access to them. Simply put, America's seniors and patients across the country are all too often not getting timely access to critical medical technologies for many years, if ever. Being science and data driven, my colleagues and I at Stanford Biodesign Policy Program have taken some time to just study how difficult the environment has become. In work we published last January, we surveyed 336 healthcare innovators and investors to ask how long, based on their own experience, it took for breakthrough new medical technologies to achieve Medicare coverage, coding, and payment. Our research found that Medicare patients often wait many years to get access to FDA authorized technologies. Survey respondents reported that nationwide Medicare coverage for breakthrough medical technologies takes an average of 4.7 years following FDA authorization. While a survey of opinions of the innovators was a place to start, our group followed up this work and used publicly available data to determine what the actual reality is, and it's much worse than we thought. In this second study, we discovered of novel medical technologies authorized by the FDA between 2016 and 2019, only 44% achieved nominal Medicare coverage by the end of 2022. And the median time to achieve this novel nominal coverage was actually 5.7 years, a whole year longer than our initial survey indicated. We are working towards publishing the results of this second study in the near future. In our original study, over half the innovators said that they were unlikely to take on a breakthrough medical technology project without some form of accelerated reimbursement pathway. The reimbursement pathways are so challenging right now that 69% of respondents who made investments in companies developing breakthrough medical technologies said they would be less likely to do so again unless there was an ex expedited re reimbursement pathway. While we've not studied the impact of these delays and decisions on actual patient morbidity and mortality, given that these diseases address, I'm sorry, these technologies address diseases such as diabetes, stroke, cancer, heart disease, spine, and orthopedic disorders, we are confident that when we do this further analysis, we are likely to find the impact on patients will be significant. We're eagerly awaiting the release of a new proposed rule from CMS and hopeful that it is a meaningful and impactful proposal that will accelerate patient access to critical medical technologies. The tragic truth is, while this valley of death remains, patients throughout the United States in each of your congressional districts are being impacted, unable to access breakthrough medical technologies that have been proven safe and effective by the FDA. In addition to CMS's rulemaking, Congress has introduced legislation to address these serious concerns for the past three sessions with strong bipartisan support, including in the last session, Cures 2.0. At root, the concept that would be ideal is to obtain coverage very shortly after FDA authorization, allowing for any continued evidence collection to be obtained as the process of adoption begins. As a physician and innovator, I encourage all of you to continue the strong bipartisan work towards achieving this towards addressing this growing concern. The work that we have invested in inventing and developing cures, therapies, and diagnostics are only beneficial when patients and providers can access them. Thank you, Chairman Buchanan and Ranking Member Dodgett for the opportunity to testify today. I also want to thank the entire committee for their support of the science that has led to these important breakthroughs. And I look forward to working with you and all the members of this body to achieve our common goal of improving patient care and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ka uh, Kesselheim. You're recognized. Uh, Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Doggett, members of the subcommittee, my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a primary care doctor and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, where I run the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, or PORTAL, at Brigham Women's Hospital. I want to focus my comments today on meaningful drug innovation, because not all innovation is the same. Meaningful drug innovation provides useful benefits to patients with diseases that don't have effective therapies or measurably improves upon existing treatments. One way the government generates meaningful innovation is through funding by the NIH. While individual manufacturers certainly contribute to drug development, NIH funding provides extensive contributions, usually at the earliest stages when the risk is greatest and private companies are not willing to get involved. One highly visible recent example that occurred with the, occurred with the mRNA COVID vaccines. 
Here, the U.S. government invested about $32 billion to develop, produce, and purchase vaccines and provided a guaranteed market for the final stages of development, almost completely de-risking the investment for manufacturers. In my written comments, I review the substantial and essential role played by public funding in transformative drugs like sofosfavir for hepatitis C, TDF-FTC for HIV PrEP, buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, as well as every cell and gene therapy available in the U.S. But meaningful drug innovation is unfortunately quite rare. In the last decade, fewer than one-third of new drugs demonstrated meaningful added therapeutic benefits. Yet these drugs, like all brand-name drugs in the U.S., are invariably expensive, costing far more than patients spend for the same drugs in other industrialized countries. Drug launch prices have increased exponentially, such that about half of new drugs are now initially priced above $150,000 a year. Low additional value drugs are also widely advertised, as anybody who's watched a football game could tell you, making up about three quarters of top advertised drugs. As a result, a large number of U.S. patients use low added value drugs at substantial cost to them in the U.S. healthcare system. We found that over half of the 50 top selling drugs in Medicare had low added clinical benefits, accounting for $20 billion in annual net, uh, net spending. Since the government, through Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs, is also the single biggest purchaser of drugs in the U.S., it must distinguish between meaningful drug innovation and innovation that doesn't add to patients' outcomes. In the case of aducanumab for Alzheimer's disease, the FDA approved the drug based on no clear evidence that it worked, and despite it causing potentially dangerous brain swelling and bleeding in up to 40% of the patients who took it. The manufacturer still priced it at initially $56,000 a year, which could have led the government to pay for this one drug more than the entire budget of NASA. So the CMS issued a national coverage determination to restrict payment to the context of a clinical trial, which is exactly what was needed to determine whether or not the drug actually worked. As a second example, CMMI recently announced a project to pay less for accelerate approval drugs, which are FDA approved based on unvalidated surrogate measures only yet they are just as exceedingly expensive as traditional approvals. Why should taxpayers pay whatever excessively high prices the manufacturer wants to set for a drug without evidence that it affects clinical outcomes that patients care about, how patients feel, function, or survive? CMMI's plan also provides incentives manufacturers need to complete confirmatory studies in a timely fashion and get evidence for these drugs' actual clinical benefits. The price can then be adjusted if the drug is actually meaningfully innovative. In the past two years alone, about two dozen accelerated approval drug indications have been withdrawn after negative confirmatory studies. As a final example, CMS under the Trump administration issued a problematic rule to require CMS to pay for every medical device labeled as a breakthrough by the FDA. But the FDA's criteria for this designation were so lax that, as Representative Doggett pointed out, over 200 devices qualified in the first three years of the program, and some of those didn't actually show any useful benefits for patients and had important safety risks. Smartly, CMS has since walked back from this rule to avoid the government wasting taxpayer dollars. Congress can help further support meaningful drug innovation. I have three ideas for you today. First, the NIH's budget should be doubled. But shockingly, a bill passed by the House instead cut NIH's funding by $10 billion. This would devastate future transformative drug development and doom the prospects of patients getting useful treatments in many areas of unmet medical need. Second, Congress should give the government more authority to reduce unnecessary spending on excessively priced drugs that do not provide meaningful clinical benefits to patients. For example, the Inflation Reduction Act vested in CMS the authority to negotiate prices for certain drugs based on their clinical value and other important factors. But the bill has numerous exclusions, including having to wait at least 9 to 13 years before negotiated prices take effect. Congress should build on the IRA to negotiate fair prices for all new drugs shortly after approval, as is done in all other industrialized countries. Finally, the U.S. should look for new ways to ensure patients and taxpayers only pay for meaningful innovation by establishing a new expert organization to provide evidence-based reports on new drugs' added clinical value, pricing, and any disparities in access. This body can help patients better distinguish meaningful and less useful innovation and make important clinical decisions about them. All of these steps will better help ensure that meaningful innovation is, is incentivized and that patients aren't going bankrupt or putting their health at risk spending money on low-value drugs or medical devices. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of you for your testimony. We'll now to proceed to the questions and answer session, and I will begin. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, what an incredible story, and I just appreciate your courage and and you being here today to speak on behalf of 6.7 million people. Yes, sir. Um, 
you know, I've been impacted, with, you know, a family member myself, so I took care of my dad for almost 10 years, so I know what that process, not just you're going through, but your family and uh, community of friends and everybody else. I guess what more can we do to help you? What would be the top priorities? I want to give you a little bit more time to talk about where, we, you know, kind of where we go from here. I know in terms of the, the drugs, there's a third one out that has possibilities, and it seems like it's getting a little bit better. But as someone said, you know, just taking the drugs, even if you get another six months of your life, if you start now, it make, is, a, is a gigantic difference, and there's a lot to be said for that. Um, but I just want to turn it over to you and give you a little time to talk, talk us through that. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, eight months. I wake up with one day. I wake up with one day. And so you're looking at me and saying, what does eight months mean? Well, if you ever spent some time with me, you'd see that in that one day, I pack a lot. I pack time for family, friends, my community, my government, my religion. In one day, you give me eight months and see what I'll do. See what many of these people will do that are not getting access to these drugs and they're slipping away every day. So for me, it means more time to be me again. I'm already losing the memories. I'm already losing who I was in my community. That's okay, things have changed. But help me have a new beginning. This disease has changed. We are now in the era of treatment and I need your help to take us the rest of the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ocon. You talked about a lot of different things. I wanted to get your, your ability just to expand on some of the thoughts that you had in terms of the patents and innovation and stuff that you were. Well, well first of all, um, Mr. Chairman, I mean, you talk about the last decade, 10 years in cancer, it's remarkable. Uh, I have heard story after story, as I said, my wife, who was an oncology nurse for 10 years until 2019, when I asked her what was the breakthrough, and she talked about IO drugs, she said it's just absolutely remarkable. And we live in an era now where the understanding of the genetic backgrounds, access to biomarker testings are really allowing us to do more precision medicine. So my biggest fear is that when we talk about negotiating drug prices, in my world of cancer, you're talking about a life cycle of drugs, that a drug being launched and introduced for one, maybe even two indications, and subsequent, in, in my written testimony, I referred to a drug, Imbruvica, that was over nine years had 11 different indications. So my biggest concern is that we keep the innovation going in cancer care and not stop the innovation, not on a particular drug, on the indications after it's launched. Well, thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Doggett, for any questions that he might have. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say first, uh, appreciate all the witness testimony, but certainly the courage that you show, Mr. Gonzalez, in confronting this cruel disease and in being here as a very forceful advocate today. I have a long relationship with the Alzheimer's Association, and I recognize the, the true desperation that many families feel about this. I think that uh, much of the research shows that a good way to get new cures is to invest in the NIH, the taxpayer-financed disease-specific research. There's some indication that a 10 percent increase in NIH disease-specific research yields a 4 to 5 percent increase in new drugs. Uh, and so I'm particularly concerned that under what we've termed the uh, Republican Default on America legislation that was approved a week ago that a 22 percent cut in NIH funding is going to deny us uh, the very kind of cures that all of us uh, today seek. Uh, and as far as Big Pharma is concerned, uh, my uh, concern is that it often intimidates patients and disease advocacy groups that anything that touches their bottom line that prevents them from charging all that those who seek uh, a little more time uh, with their families, uh, that they can charge whatever that the market will bear. 
i think paying outrageous drug prices hasn't resulted in innovation in fact i think it's had just the opposite effect dr castle heim you've cited the enormous contribution that in i h funding research has had uh... and uh... can you just speak to the differences in research conducted by manufacturers you purely have a profit motive and the research that is being funded by the american taxpayer who has a strong interest in meeting public health needs. Sure, so the, the NIH tends to fund a lot of the early stages in drug development. As you pointed out, every single drug can ultimately trace its origins back to NIH funding in basic and translational science. But what we've found actually in some of the research done at Portal is that a lot of the most transformative, most important drugs are also, can also be linked to public funding in their later stages of development as well. From, um, from, the from, from testing the original, from the, the original testing on the product, even to some of the, the clinical trials as well. That tends to be where, where um, manufacturer funding uh, of, of, of new drugs tends to uh, predominate in those later stages. Uh, the risk is less, and actually as the trials get larger and larger, the risk gets smaller and smaller, and a lot of uh, industry funding also goes into making small changes to drugs after they've already been approved uh, to extend their market exclusivity uh, on, the, on the underlying active ingredient as long as possible. You know, as we've heard today, uh, whether it's Alzheimer's or ALS or cancer, uh, there is a desperation to get these new cures. Uh, I think that patients deserve a system that generates innovative research, uh, but uh, I would just ask you about the accelerated approval process and whether that is providing false hope in many cases or is providing real hope for cures. I think that the accelerated approval pathway is a useful pathway when used correctly. It, it provides, um, you know, early access to very promising treatments on the on the promise that they will eventually do cl uh, um, meaningful clinical testing. I mean, you emphasize, you mentioned the word cures. I think we all want cures or meaningful innovation. The problem with accelerated approval drugs is that a lot of them are, when, when they are in given accelerated approval, we don't actually know what they do. There is some suggestion there, there is some promise there, they need additional testing. Uh, they are not the same as drugs approved on the basis of showing changes to actual clinical endpoints like, um, like many traditional approval drugs are. Uh, while my uh, focus has been principally on drug pricing today, uh, this hearing also, of course, deals with the question of medical devices. Uh, through the years, we've had some bipartisan concern about medical device safety. I've worked with colleagues from this committee like Bill Pascrell and Brian Fitzpatrick. Senator Warren and Senator Grassley have uh, sought greater accountability on post-market surveillance of safety concerns. Uh, Dr. Kasselheim, uh, knowing of the negative repercussions of misaligned incentives in Medicare reimbursement, as well as safety and efficacy concerns, that arise from these devices, do you think it's appropriate for Medicare to guarantee 100 percent coverage of so-called breakthrough devices? It is not. Your coverage in Medicare should be what is reasonable and necessary. That is not the same thing as the uh, breakthrough therapy designation, which is given by the FDA at extreme, at sometimes extremely early stages of device development when we don't actually know what effect the device will have on patient outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Smith. Nebraska. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of our witnesses. And Mr. Gonzalez, thank you for sharing your story here today. I, I do want to associate myself with the concerns that Chairman Buchanan expressed regarding the TRIPS waiver. As Chairman of the Trade Subcommittee, this is obviously an important issue that is of great concern to me as well. However, in the interest of time, I would like to focus on my concerns with the CMS Innovation Center, known as CMMI. Tasked with testing payment and care delivery models in order to save Medicare money and improve patient care quality, CMS has tested more than 50 models since its creation. Despite billions of taxpayer dollars spent setting up and evaluating these models, only six of these were found to have delivered statistically significant savings, actually a less than 12% success rate. Instead, these models have been used to make major, often controversial changes to fundamental parts of the Medicare benefit, such as Part B drugs, kidney care, oncology, and more, often generating bipartisan concern. For example, I do have a copy of a June 2021 letter which Congresswoman Terry Sewell and I sent to CMS, along with 24 bipartisan co-signers, 
expressing concerns with a lack of transparency and stakeholder participation in CMMI's model development process. Mr. Chairman, I would request this letter be inserted into the hearing record. So moved. Thank you. I've also worked on legislation which would create some common sense guardrails for, for CMMI to ensure the design, testing, and expansion of these models is in line with congressional intent. This legislation has been bipartisan in the past. I introduced the first version of this bill during the Trump administration, proof that these long-standing concerns are not tied to a specific president or one particular model. I hope we can continue working on that legislation in a bipartisan fashion. Mr. Ocon, your organization works with patients who have been impacted by CMMI models in the past. Based on your experiences, what do you feel are the most necessary guardrails to ensure the integrity of model testing without unnecessarily hurting beneficiaries or providers? Yeah, Mr. Smith, this is, as I said uh, in my opening statement, we've now had three administrations that have basically have gone over to what I call the little toy box called CMMI and pulled out and basically tried to basically end run all of you in Congress to uh, change drug reimbursement. And I think that is extremely, extremely dangerous. And I think that, so when you talk about guardrails specifically, if you go back and read the law, the ACA that cre cre created CMMI, the whole concept was that you would do a limited phase one model that then if it worked and saved money and didn't hurt patients, enhance care, that you would do a expanded phase two model. That's not happening. This is, if you look at the president's recent executive order, it's let's go use CMMI to change drug pricing. So I think there are a lot of guardrails. I think what you did and, and, and Mrs. Ms. Sewell, it just, this should be duplicated again and the entire Congress should put guardrails on CMMI so that it's not a vehicle to end run the Congress. It's a true vehicle to test innovation. And one more thing, I was the biggest proponent of CMMI when it was created. The idea of having an innovation center in, in CMS. But I don't think it's upheld that charter. Thank you. Appreciate your, your insight. Uh, moving along here, apologize for uh, the brevity of, time, of our time. One of the healthcare sectors which stands to benefit the most from new and emerging technologies is care delivery at home. We know that care in the home allows patients to receive necessary uh, clo uh, necessary care close to their families and caregivers without needing to worry about transportation, whether it's dialysis, uh, other in innovative approaches. So ultimately, uh, Dr. Uh, Lactawala, can you walk us through how innovators would factor potential Medicare coverage of a breakthrough product into their research and investment uh, calculation and how that uh, could be applied in, in home care as well? Sure, th thank you for the question. Um, I think. Part of what part of the uncertainty that we face right now regarding um, the uh, incentives for innovation is how CMS is going to think about setting maximum fair prices, and we don't know very much about it. My hope is that CMS will employ uh, modern economic methods to include value to patients as part of their maximum fair price assessment, and if it does so, then the kinds of issues that you raise, Congressman would absolutely be part of the calculus regarding value to patients. Alzheimer's disease is a salient example here. It imposes considerable burdens on patients and families outside of what you might consider traditional healthcare spending. Those kinds of impacts in terms of caregiver burden, uh, transportation, disruption to lives are all part of value, and it goes to the question of paying more for more valuable technologies and paying less for less valuable technologies. Okay, thank you, I yield back. Mr. Thompson, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all, to all of our witnesses for being here. And, and Mr. Gonzalez, thank you very much for your very compelling uh, testimony. And I think everyone would agree that we need to do everything we can to make sure uh, uh, patients get the medications that they need and that will make them uh, healthy. Uh, I'd like to start by reminding folks that the Inflation Reduction Act uh, which we passed in the last Congress, with no help from our Republican colleagues, uh, reduced the deficit by $300 billion over 10 years. And the drug price negotiation provisions in that bill saved taxpayers $288 billion. We also capped the price of insulin at $35 a month and capped seniors' out-of-pocket costs at $2,000 per year. 
I'm not sure what my colleagues who voted against this bill hear from their constituents, but I can tell you the seniors I hear from at home are pretty darn happy with these changes. I'd also like to just make a couple of very obvious facts um, uh, known. One, uh, you can have the most exciting, innovative drug in the world, but if you can't, if no one can afford to buy it, it doesn't help a single person. And two, Americans pay more for the same drugs than people in other countries do. And three, in every other industrialized country, the government negotiates drug prices with manufacturers. They do not just take whatever price the manufacturer wants. And that's where I'd like to begin uh, my questioning. Uh, Mr. Kesselhelm, uh, Dr. Kesselhelm, uh, you talked about the importance of funding the National Institute of Health. We've heard a lot today about how high drug prices are apparently necessary to fund research and development. Can you talk a little more about how the Research Taxpayers Fund at NIH has helped pharmaceutical companies develop their products? Sure. The, the research that goes on at NIH is fundamental to, to drug development and uh, manufact it, it helps uh, identify targets, it helps identify the origins of disease, uh, it helps identify the systems and create um, testing systems in which drugs can be tested. All of that information is then used by manufacturers when, uh, you know, in, 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 in developing particular products or moving particular products forward. Sometimes NIH funding even supports clinical trials and proof of concept. Um, so the, the NIH funding uh, does a lot of work in, in developing, in, in leading to drug development, particularly the, the most important drugs that we have. Thank you. You also, uh, in your testimony, stated that we uh, should expand, not repeal, the negotiation uh, provisions that we passed in the Inflation Reduction Act? That's right. We, the, right now, the negotiations in the Inflation Reduction Act occur at about 9 to 13, or, or implemented at about 9 to 13 years after the drug is approved. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, in, in every other industrialized country, uh, the prices are negotiated at the time of, of near, near the time of drug approval. Those prices can be negotiated fairly such that important, meaningful, clinically meaningful drugs are given a substantial reimbursement, but most importantly, this, a lot of drugs out there do not offer added clinical benefits. Those drugs can be, uh, the, the prices of those drugs can be restrained to where, uh, and, and negotiated to a point where they are more reflective of the, of the actual value that they provide. So just a, a little more on criteria. If we were to expand uh, drugs eligible uh, for the negotiations, what sort of criteria should we use? I think that all, all new drugs should be eligible for negotiation within a year of their being uh, first approved by the FDA. That would be uh, the most fair way of going about it. And if we have to do them piece by piece, are there drugs uh, that are unfairly priced or drugs that are transformative for patients? Should they be moved to the head of the line? How do, how do you, how do you uh, work all of that out? Well, right now, uh, right now in the way that it's done in Germany, for example, is that all drugs, the price for the drug is set by the manufacturer, and that is the price for the first year. And during that first year, all drugs are, go through an uh, evaluation process to determine how clinically meaningful they are. And then at the, at the year, one year point, the drug is negotiated um, a, a in line with that, with that clinical meaningfulness. So um, I think that that's a, that's a model where, again, you, you're not blocking drugs from getting on the market. Drugs can get on the market. Patients can get access to them. And then what we eventually do is very soon thereafter figure out what the fair price of those drugs should be. And I think that in taking into account that fair price, you definitely need to account the, if, uh, if, manu if the National Institutes of Health or some other public entity was a substantial contributor to the funding of those products and de-risked the, um, the investment that, that the subsequent um, manufacturers made in them. Thank you very much. Yield back. Mr. Kelly, Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's interesting because we ask you all to give up a day of your life to come in and, and talk to us, and then you have five minutes to try to get out, which you've already presented to us in writing, and then we try to hurry up and ask you a question. So, Mr. Ocon, uh, what you all do and the doctors you work with are incredible. Um, Dr. Winsett, when I were talking, uh, it would be good to get some, some actual operators, doctors who work through this every single day. Uh, as, uh, as a Hyundai dealer, I'm involved in something called Hope on Wheels. 
So this is an effort between Hyundai Motor America and Hyundai Motor dealers for every single Hyundai that's sold, there's a contribution that's made uh, towards the development of, or the eradication of, of childhood cancer, the, with the goal being that no parent, no family ever has to hear that your child has cancer. So far, we've raised about $225 million, which is significant, but not near enough. And, and so I look at what it is that we're trying to do. Well, President Biden shares the same goal we all have. Uh, we don't want anybody to have to suffer. Now, his Cancer Moonshot in, uh, initiative is, is really admirable, and that's why I'm so concerned that at the same time he was relaunching the Moonshot, the administration was taking major steps to devalue the accelerated approval pathway for new drugs coming onto the market. Now, CMS did this first with Alzheimer's drugs. Then CMS Administrator uh, Brooks Lesseur said she viewed accelerated approval as a as being separate from traditional approval. About 85% of all drugs that go through the accelerated approval program are cancer drugs. So if CMS is successful in expanding the Alzheimer's precedent to other categories of drugs like cancer drugs, patients will see their success to these innovative new life-saving cures severely restricted or even cut off altogether. So Mr. Ocon, what effect will this have on cancer patients? I, I'm, I'm specifically, I, the, the children that I've seen it is so important that cancer patients, because of the nature of this disease, it's not cancer singular. It's over 200 cancers. And Mr. Kelly, when you look at certain cancers like breast cancer, there's HER2 positive, HER2 negative, there's adjuvant, there's metastatic. And so we've got to get away from the notion that this is a cookbook. We know now more about the genetic profile we have biomarkers that allow us to do more precision medicine. And what may work on one individual who looks and talks like another individual, the drug may work on one and not the other. And I'm particularly concerned about pediatric cancers that treatments typically get developed after in the life cycle of the drug, adult cancers. And again, I go back to saying that if you're facing, and you're a manufacturer, if you're, you're a businessman, you're facing putting more money into research, and you know the drug is going to get negotiated downwards, it's a problem. And I think one of the fundamental problems that you hear here is that there are very different drugs that we're talking about. When you talk about Alzheimer's, when you talk about cancer, that's very different than other areas of, of medicine, and that's what's so important. So it's, it, it is, it is, it's alarming. It is alarming. The, you know, the, the size and scope of the government is incredible, and trying to work your way through it is almost impossible. I, I, uh, I admire all of you for what you do yeah. and the frustration that you must face every single day when you're trying to help people and cure people and knowing that the process you're going to go through is oftentimes more difficult than the answer you're trying to find. Uh, I, I think too often we concentrate on the cost of things and not on the effect of things. Uh, I, I, I wish we could get this reversed, but uh, I don't know. I think it would be wonderful if, not just in this committee, but in all of the Congress, we could concentrate more on policy and less on politics. I think the answers and the developments would be incredible. I want to thank you all for being here. You give, and Mr. Gonzalez, you give a very inspiring time. Uh, the best time I've spent is with my grandchildren. I'm hoping that sometime in the future they look back and say the best time they spent was with their grandfather. God bless you. Good luck with everything. But the rest of you, thanks so much for what you're doing. We appreciate you being here today. I yield back. Yeah. Mr. Blumenauer, Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we're looking at different aspects of this challenge. Um, one of the things that hasn't been focused on here is that we're forcing American consumers to pay the highest drug prices in the world, assuming that this filters out in terms of innovation. Dr. Kessenbaugh, you point out that um, the majority of the uh, innovations, and they're more engineering patents, not new medicines. They're repackaging so that they can express, uh, gain more uh, value over time. Uh, this high cost of medic medicine is driving this showdown that we've got over the deficit that is 
encouraging my Republican friends to vote for a 22 percent reduction in the National Institute of Health. Uh, we've got to get a handle on exploding costs. Um, and it just seems to me, Dr. Kessenbaum, you, you highlight some of the problems associated with rushed approval without showing benefits. You talked about brain sweat. You want to talk a little bit about the danger of giving people medicine that hasn't been fully vetted and shown that it is, provides benefits for people? We don't want to give false hope to folks if their brain's going to swell or something like that. Can you elaborate on part of what you put in your testimony? Sure. So I, as I think that that's a fundamental role that the FDA plays in this process is to try to make sure that when drugs are approved, that there, are, that there is a clear effectiveness that, the, that those drugs will have and that, that those benefits outweigh the risks of those drugs. Um, I think that the FDA, unfortunately, did not do its job in the case of aducanumab um, because of the lack of clear evidence of benefits and the substantial risks that were associated with those drugs, including the risk of brain swelling and bleeding in up to 40 percent of patients who received that drug. And so um, I think that in, those, in that context, um, CMS did the best that it could um, by saying, look, we're only going to pay for this drug if it's being tested to show if the drug actually works in the first place. I thought it was a totally reasonable approach given the, um, the fact that the FDA made a, made a bad decision um, in approving that particular drug. Um, and that, that, again, is why we have a process in which we, we, want, we need to gather evidence about drugs and new devices because they can be so dangerous. They can be so effective and so useful and transformative, um, but they can also be very dangerous, and that's why we need adequate testing of them. And, um, you know, the FDA, when the FDA is given flexibility, as in the accelerated approval pathway, to approve drugs before they're shown to have benefits, then we need a clear pathway uh, to, to generate those after approval um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's what the CMMI proposal is intended to do, is intended to limit, pay, limit spending on those drugs until we actually know whether or not they work. And then, of course, the, the price can be, uh, you know, raised to the appropriate level. In your testimony, you talked about 81 top advertised drugs, but only 27 percent of them uh, were demonstrated of having high therapeutic value. That's right. So uh, we are we are deluged. So as doctors, you know, doctors receive um, a lot of, of promotion of, of drugs, but the, the consumers are also deluged with um, with drug advertising. And in a study that we recently did and, and published in the JAMA Network, um, we looked at um, at all the top advertised drugs uh, and found that only 20 percent of them were shown to have added clinical value to patients. And so um, really good, important drugs sell themselves. Doctors will prescribe them and use them, and patients will ask for them. Uh, and so that's I think, is why we see a lot of uh, ad direct-to-consumer advertising that, that involves uh, drugs that don't have a lot of added clinical value. I think this is very important. The pharmaceutical industry spends more money on advertising than they do on research. We need to be sure that we are getting high value. We're in the process of, of having this battle over the deficit. What we're talking about here is an opportunity to be able to rein in some of these extreme costs, to be able to give more value to the taxpayer and not give them medicine that will give them false hope or worse, even be dangerous. The American public is paying for the research for around the world, and it's doing so in a very inefficient fashion. And I appreciate, Doctor, it's not just because you're wearing a bow tie, but I appreciate what you put in your testimony talking about the downsides of rushing, undercutting a process to make sure that it actually has value, and holding the industry accountable. We've all got experiences in our family of people who uh, suffered, for example, with Alzheimer's. I don't want to give false hope. Worse than that, I don't want to give medicine that will do damage or that we're going to end up cutting services and research because we haven't been able to do our job right. I yield back. Dr. Winstrup, Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. You know, it's discouraging to see at any time, if we are doing things that inhibit innovation and limit patient access to the latest treatments or discourage investment in new technologies and cures, 
Uh, as a physician, I know how first I know firsthand how dangerous it is to delay or deny access uh, a proper treatment to a patient. And I think Americans deserve better than that. That's the system we're living in. Uh, Dr. Kesselheim, you, you mentioned NIH. We have a doctor's caucus here. We've been out to NIH. They do some wonderful things. There is no doubt about it. We've been very supportive of NIH in many, many ways, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't have oversight over everything that they do and where the money is being spent. And uh, no one is that godly, okay, that they can't be questioned on the type of research they do. And you mentioned the difference. We've had great things come out of the commercial industry, great things come out of NIH. Uh, but I will tell you what commercial industry has not done. They haven't funded research to create viruses that become more infectious to human beings and kill millions of people. Okay, so there is a difference there sometimes, and we have to watch over that as a country. But I'll tell you, we as a doctor's caucus, we're meeting with CMS about eight years ago, and they're telling us how great everything's working now, the things that they're implementing. And I looked her in the eye and I said, do you know why we're here? Do you know why, why we're in Congress? Because you've taken the joy out of taking care of people. And that is what has happened over time. You know, I hear my colleagues saying, I don't want to give anybody a medicine. You don't give anybody a medicine, my friend. Doctors do, and patients decide. They do this together. And so what's really missing with some of the things that you're talking about, it takes away the power of hope. And I don't mean false hope. When you have good bedside banner, you talk about all the odds, and maybe this will help, and maybe it won't. And that's fair, and it's called bedside manner. But that's what's missing in these discussions up here. It's totally missing. We don't talk about the value of prevention up here. We don't talk about the value of cures and the savings. We don't talk about the value of someone's life. It's all dollars and cents. That's all it is. We don't talk about how someone may live longer and continue to go to work and pay taxes, right? We don't talk about the value of productive life because this medicine, even though you might have a chronic disease, is allowing you to live a life, and I know you understand this, Mr. Gonzalez, and doctors that sit there every day with patients in front of them and look them in the eye and talk to them, they understand it. The people that wear the white coats, not the ones writing the white papers. I'm sorry. So here we are. You know, it's, uh, that we look at MSIT, the MSIT rule. It's been more than two years. The Biden administration has not proposed a replacement rule for this. If you didn't like it and you canceled it, fine, but tell us why. And tell us what data you used that said you needed to cancel it. And there's been no discussion on this since. So I'm proud to work with Representatives Del Benny, Blake Moore, Terry Sewell to introduce the Ensuring Patient Access to Critical Breakthrough Products Act. It's bipartisan. A bill that would codify the MSIT rule and give millions of seniors a chance to live longer healthier lives while supporting the companies and innovators who are investing in these critical medical technologies and devices. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Con uh, Oaken, the, one of the most important reasons for providing this pathway is to give patients access to technologies that will improve their health and extend their lives. Mr. Oaken, what does further delay in the MSIT rule mean for patients who are waiting for the next novel treatment? Well, well again, I, I can say, Dr. Winstrup, is that um, cancer patients, because of the knowledge that we have, as you know, about so much more of their makeup, um, they depend on innovation. They depend on new drugs. And so, and especially when you look at, um, you know, some of the rare cancer, pediatric cancer. So I applaud all of you. I applaud anything bipartisan. And the idea that, that th it, this would push the MSET, I think, is absolutely key and certainly important in cancer care. And it's upon us to make sure that something like this exactly. is working and doing what it's intended to do, not just say, it's okay, let it go. And uh, Dr. Dr. McHower, how are the current challenges around Medicare coverage impacting investment into breakthrough technologies, and what impact could a bill like the Ensuring Patient Access to Critical Breakthrough Products Act or a new CMS rule have on the development of new technologies? Thank you for the question. I think that it's often lost on people that most of the new and novel medical technologies are actually 
created by very small venture-backed companies that rely on investors to support their work. Um, the, during the time that there was a belief that MSIT actually was going to be um, put into place, there was an amazing wave of enthusiasm and investment that went into breakthrough therapies that could really make a difference in people's lives. Areas like diabetes, um, heart disease, uh, very challenging and very difficult problems to solve, but given the encouragement that there would be a bridge to somewhere, um, an opportunity to bring their products to patients on the other side, that investment was spurred. When MEMSIT was cast aside, there was definitely an impact in, in the industry and in the innovative community. And I would say, as the, our survey indicated, the impact of not having a clear pathway to coverage and reimbursement on the other side of all the work that goes into demonstrating that a product is safe and effective with the FDA is a real depressing um, factor for in further investment in very important therapies for, for patients. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. Higgins, New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, drug development, you know, firstly, is a, a long, drawn-out process. You know, on average, it takes 10 to 15 years to develop fully a drug. It's a public-private partnership. Uh, the federal government is typically involved in the front end, which is much less profitable, and then when those drugs reach a point of going into clinical trials to test both safety and efficacy, uh, the pharmaceutical industry becomes involved. And that's the profit earning phase of drug development. You know, for example, the messenger RNA, which is the genetic material that tells or instructs a cell to make a protein, which was the active ingredient in the mRNA vaccine um, was a result of decades of drug development financed by the federal government. So the federal government isn't in the way. It's really leading the way. And that has to be acknowledged. You know, you think about it, for the first seven months of COVID, the best thing that our healthcare system could do to somebody that was stuck with COVID is to give them Tylenol to reduce pain in, in, in fever. Uh, these drugs were developed and they accrued to the great benefit of the private sector because of federal government financed basic research. For example, Moderna, which developed one of the M messenger RNA vaccines, pre-COVID it was $20 a share. At the peak of COVID it was $497 share. So it's always a public-private partnership, and virtually every drug that came to market in the last 10 years, the federal government had a major financial role in bringing that drug to market. It doesn't really get any profit from it. It just does it because it's the right thing to do. So, you know, the whole idea of, you know, being critical of the federal government, I can see, Mr. Gonzalez, you, you provided very compelling and, and thoughtful testimony. I, I thank you for that. But I think we need to understand the role that each has. And it, you, know, it's, you know, all these horrible chronic diseases, you know, the pharmaceutical company spends billions of dollars in advertising. And you watch those commercials, everybody's happy, it's sunny, it's great music, and everybody's good looking. But the idea is to get consumers to say, yeah, I want that because I want to look like that. I want to feel like that. And sometimes it's not the best treatment for an individual. So, and the other thing is, you know, innovation by its very definition is inefficient. 90% of clinical trials fail. So the only failure in drug development research is when you quit or you're forced to quit because of lack of funding. So let's recognize the important role of both the federal government and the private sector. Dr. Kesselheim, 
You noted in your testimony that the Republican bill just passed the House on the debt ceiling would result in significant cuts to the National Institutes of Health. That is the, exactly the opposite of what we should be doing right now. We should be increasing our investment in medical research, not slashing it. Do you care to offer some thoughts? Yes, I think I, I completely agree. I feel like n n we should not be cutting the NIH budget. We should be doubling the NIH budget because the, there is a, a, a long track record of success of the NIH investing in, uh, in transformative drugs. And so um, I think that if we provide more opportunities for that, uh, then we will get more drugs for unmet medical need and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and we, will, we will be able to help patients better that way. Anybody else? For me, I heard a few things today, and I'll try to explain this as best as I can. Meaningful and necessary. What is meaningful and necessary continually comes over and over in the data and the things that I see in the press. And I think I have demonstrated and talked to you about what is meaningful and, and necessary in my life. But let me ask you, what's meaningful and necessary in your life? What if this were you? I'm not much older than you. And you're older than me. The government should not be having this conversation with me. This should be between myself and my physician. The fact that I have to travel across this country of ours, this great country of ours, and deal with this disease, not knowing where I'm at, having my wife near me every single time, being cold, shaking, shivering, This needs to be between a patient and their doctor, period. That's what I need. That's what I want. Well, it was my understanding the accelerated approval was created to give people with unmet needs, it helps the innovation that they deserve. So what the heck are we doing? I'm here, yes, to tell you my story. But think about those, while well, you're thinking about cost and you're thinking about finance, let me let you in on what to think about. I don't get to have a checkbook anymore, sir. I don't get to have money with me anymore because I can't be trusted with it because I can't do the math anymore. I have a first grade level math. And I served as a CEO. I served well in business, real estate. And now, a first, you can look at me, a first grade level math. What is reasonable and necessary is that we need this to go between the patient and the doctor. Thank you. Yield back. Dr. Murphy, North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just reiterate, Mr. Gonzalez, patient doctor, right? Because what the last administration did with the whole damn vaccine fiasco was made it between a government and a citizen. I'll just, I'll go back to that. We were pro-vaccine but damn it, everybody didn't need it. And it took the power of doctors in prescribing away. All right, I'll get back to this issue because I think we've just kind of gone on a little bit uh, disarray here. I will, I will join every single Republican and Democrat here. We need to cut the cost of medicine. And if we can pass a bill that gets rid of direct consumer advertising, I hope we can make a unanimous vote. Because I will tell you, I have never in my 30 years of prescribing to this day ever prescribed anything because of seeing people on the television. And patients will come in every so often and they'll say, what about this drug? I said, this drug is nice, but you don't have that disease, okay? So it, it provides no benefit. We're one of two countries in the world. New Zealand is the other one that provides direct to consumer advertising. So let's get rid of that. Let's attack PBMs, which have become an absolute parasite and extorted monies from patients and pharmaceutical companies just to the, the expense uh, bottom line of insurance companies. Let's have some meaningful legislation on that. Let's really get to the problem of this in the United States. Because no other country does that. They don't direct consumer advertising or PBMs. So um, guys, you know, it, it, it just, it kills me here. I think our, our Democratic colleagues started out with well-intentioned, but they did not think about the secondary, tertiary, quaternary consequences. Yeah, moonshot cancer's great, but if you ain't got no fuel for the rocket, where's it gonna go? If you can't do anything with that, it's not gonna work. 
You know, uh, Dr. Kesselheim, let me ask you the question. Um, do you know how much it costs to bring one drug to market, one molecule? There are a lot of varying uh, um, estimates on average. of that. It, it, uh, the, the estimates in the literature range from anywhere on average from a, a few hundred million dollars to the pharmaceutical industry estimates of a few billion dollars. I say mostly two to two and a half is the most common thing I've seen quoted. For every molecule that comes to market, how many molecules are going to that? Go into the development of that uh, drug, do you think? Well, so there, again, it, it happens at different stages. In sure. terms of the beginning of clinical trials, there are about, uh, there's about uh, 10 molecules for every one. But for the most expensive later stage clinical trials, about half of drugs tested are, are approved, so two so, to one. So uh, I've seen numbers higher than that, but I'm not going to argue with that. So we have a, a portion here where so much money and so many scientists are working on molecules with the hope of therapy. So many of our drugs do not start out doing what we think they're going to do. You know, you look at actinomycin for Wilms tumor. It was an antibiotic by God. Same thing with all the other things. This is how we develop penicillin. Nobody knew that. It's accident. So walk me through. Keytruda was started in 2000, I think, 14, right? Came out for the, uh, the indication of melanoma. What happens now? Because it now has an indication for small cell, the lung, melanoma, lymphoma, uh, rectal tumors, GI tumors, other tumors walk on and on and on. So when we have these new indications for drug, and I can walk you through about 10 of these drugs with that, I deal with prostate cancer, and Xtandi has done the same thing. I've seen such a miraculous change in 10 years from people. I normally said you had to go get your affairs in order to say, hey, you're going to see your grandkids live. So as we walk through these indications, all of a sudden we hit a wall an artificial wall that's been put up because the IRA says, nope, you can't explore this anymore, even though they could possibly cure one other thing and one other thing. And you know where it's going to hurt the most? It's in pediatric diseases, pediatric cancers. Because you know what? We have to experiment on adults first. And if we're not allowed to do indication upon indication to try to push things forward because of some artificial barrier, we're going to kill kids in the future. You look at what's happened with Wilms tumors, you look at look what happens with childhood leukemias, things that are absolutely curable today, but they would not have happened if we had not been able to march forward. Yes, I want to cut drug costs as much as anybody. You know, the $35 insulin, it's just like a balloon. You push in it here, it's going to push out somewhere else. That's the fallacy that's being told to the public. And yes, I know drugs that don't work. Tell me about the 27% of drugs that you don't think are, are, are excuse me, the other 67 63% that don't work. What are the, how do you, de, how do you define limited clinical value? So I said limited added clinical value. A lot of those drugs are drugs that do the same thing as drugs that are already on the market or drugs that are generic that are already on the market. And you know that some people re react different to every medicine. Of and course. I'll use epilepsy for an example. Somebody walks in your clinic, you can throw up 50 drugs up on the wall. And if 50 different people will react different one every time. But if you have added clinical benefit, you're going to pull away about 90% of those and say, well, if you fail this, you fail this, you fail this, good luck. You'll never drive again. But I wasn't saying you shouldn't approve those drugs. I was just saying you shouldn't pay more for them than the other drugs that are already on the market that yeah, have Yeah, but if are, you that say that, for example, way. like Germany, they see one year and say which one they're going to ratchet that down. You can't determine data in one year whether something works or not. That, doesn't, that just doesn't give you nearly enough time to determine clinical value. So, yes, we're, there are things we can do to try to cut drug costs in this country, absolutely. But this was an asinine plan to do it, and I think it's going to hurt patients. We've already had drug lines taken off, clinical lines taken off, because the pharmaceutical companies won't expend uh, interest or won't expend money because they know they won't be able to recoup it. Thank you, that, Mr. Chairman. I'll take you back. Mr. Hearn, Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for hosting this hearing on innovation in health care. Thank our witnesses. Mr. Gonzalez, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's not a member up here, or probably most in this room, haven't been touched for Alzheimer's and, and the, um, the other disorders that really uh, affect the livelihoods of our friends or our loved ones. So thank you for being here. Uh, as an engineer, I'm always fascinated by the incredible science and technology people are used to create life-saving medical devices and drugs. I want to thank my two colleagues, two doctors up here, they're expert witnesses in their own right, expert questioners uh, who, uh, who know what they're talking about, have been on the receiving end of this, have seen it, 
And uh, I, b I believe that, as I've said with many uh, instances in Congress, we have a lot of people up here talk about things they know nothing about. And when you have people who know what they're talking about, it's refreshing. Um, you know, in recent years, innovative software technologies known as prescription digital therapeutics, PDTs for short, have come to the market. These healthcare phone applications are studied in clinical trials and reviewed by the FDA for safety and efficacy before they can be prescribed to patients in healthcare and healthcare providers. You know, PDTs have been put to use in treating opioid addiction, veterans with PTSD, children with ADHD, and a host of other illnesses, including diabetes and mental health disorders. While the FDA has approved these digital health solutions, there are still roadblocks to widespread access. The current number of senior citizens on Medicare is estimated to reach nearly 61 million by the end of this year, and many of them have no access to these treatments due to lack of coverage from CMS. If America is to remain a leader in the healthcare technology innovation, we must ensure that the FDA and CMS approval process for DPTs are in sync. That is why I, along with Congressman Mike Thompson, along with a couple of senators, introduced H.R. 1458 to access the PDT Act to allow CMS to cover PDTs. While I am on the topic of FDA and CMS synchronization, I want to echo the bipartisan support we heard today for the MSET rule and Congressman Winstrup's legislation to codify it. Our seniors deserve timely access to these life-saving breakthrough treatments. Today, I also want to discuss rare disease drugs and treatments. Earlier this year in a hearing, I shared my personal connection to the rare disease community and my concern about recent legislation discouraging innovation in the space. The IRA includes an exemption from the negotiation process for orphan drugs. However, the exemption is limited to orphan drugs that are already, there are only for one rare disease or condition. As many of you know, many rare disease drugs are often discovered as a second or third indication for a drug, as my colleague just indicated. It is clear the authors of this bill wanted to protect innovation in the rare disease space, but this provision falls short. I'm calling on my Democrat colleagues to work with me on a technical fix to the bill to make sure that more rare disease drugs and treatments are protected from the negotiation process. I was really encouraged in our HHS budget hearing when Secretary Becerra committed to work with me to ensure the rare disease drug pipeline is not damaged, and again, I really hope we can work on a bipartisan fix to this issue. I believe there is a middle ground we can find that prevents abuse of orphan drug exclusion, but also protects innovation. Uh, my question, I got two short ones. Uh, Mr. McHour, or Dr. McHour, can you comment on the impact PDTs are having on patients and the need for a clear path to reimbursement? Absolutely. Digital therapeutics have a tremendous opportunity to improve patient outcomes and, and care. And it's very, very important that we find a way to cover these, these technologies for patients. Um, the, the fact that they're being currently sort of in a, in a box, unable to be reimbursed because of a technicality, is really a problem and needs to be solved. And we really need some modernization around the entire benefit category um, process. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Locke Dewalla, can you comment on the recent changes to rare disease drug policy and what impact do you anticipate? Sure. Thank you, Congressman. It's likely that there will be reduction in innovation uh, in rare disease because follow on indications are now um, potentially penalized under the IRA. It's also the case more generally there will be reductions in incentive to innovate. It's notable, though, that we, rare disease often features very high unmet need for patients. And uh, as an economist, I can tell you that uh, that means the value of any given health improvement is greater because patients have so little health that even uh, a, a given relatively modest improvement of health can be quite valuable. That needs to be accounted for in the way CMS sets maximum fair prices to at least mitigate some of these issues for rare disease where value is at a premium. Thank you for your responses. And again, thank each of you for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Ms. Sewell, Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for your testimony today, especially Mr. Gonzalez, whose testimony and life's journey is both powerful and inspiring. God bless, sir. Since the 116th Congress, I have been the 
one of the leading champions of the Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Act, along with Representative Jody Arrington. As a daughter that knows firsthand what it's like to lose a parent to pancreatic cancer, it has become my mission to ensure that every American has access to life-saving early detection tests and all the treatments to help them get well. Last Congress, this legislation garnered support from 258 bipartisan House co-sponsors and more than 400 leading advocacy groups across all 50 states. And in the 117th Congress, we hope to have more. This bill creates the authority for CMS to cover blood-based multi-cancer early detection tests and future test methods once approved by the FDA. With innovation increasing in the, in the space of cancer treatment, it is imperative that our legislation promotes an agile, evidence-based process that prioritizes safety and cost effectiveness. Mr. Castlebaum, my question is to you. The bill that I'm talking about, my multi-cancer early detection uh, bill, does not establish a coverage mandate for multi-cancer early detection tests, but rather gives CMS the authority to create coverage parameters through the national coverage determination process. In your opinion, how can we better ensure that our coverage policies are keeping a pace with medical innovation? Uh, it's a great question, and, and it sounds like, a, uh, and I, I think that it is a really important bill because early detection of cancer is so important, and that is at the time when we might be able to um, to best intervene on, particularly on on very you know very dangerous cancers like pancreatic cancer. So um, I think that if there were uh, new early detection tests that were proven to actually reduce mortality from uh, from cancers, uh, that it would be a no-brainer for CMS to cover them, and it would be important to, tr uh, and I think that this is where um, uh, collaboration between FDA and CMS can be very important in helping ensure that, that the information that is transmitted to FDA in getting a diagnostic test authorized can then be quickly evaluated and, and given the green light by CMS. And so it should be able to be done efficiently. And I think what, what hopefully what your bill can do is provide more um, resources and more um, guidance for to, to allow uh, FDA and CMS to do this in this context. It does, sir. I, I think that we should, uh, we the public, especially since we put so much money towards NIH and research and development of drugs, we should make sure that everyone has access to these amazing uh, medical innovations. Um, the reality is that there are ways that you can test blood and be able to screen for over 40 different cancers. And so when that is actually approved by FDA, I don't want it to wait. I want Medicare to cover it, especially since we know that for cancer, age is a determinant uh, in, in, um, in, in, in the diagnosis of cancer. Um, so look, I think that it's important, and, I, and I, I know for me it's cancer, for you, sir, maybe Alzheimer's. The point is we have, as a nation, really developed amazing medical innovation. Uh, the fact that we could come up with a, uh, a vaccine in 10 months for a global pandemic means that if we want to put our resources, our time, and our energy behind the best and brightest researchers and doctors, we can find cures for some of these diseases. And I believe that our job um, on Ways and Means, especially around Medicare, is to help facilitate that. And one of the things that I had hoped was the Center uh, for Innovation with CMS, CM, um, CMS would do that. Um, Mr. Uh, Okan, can you talk a little bit more, elaborate more about the guardrails that we really need for CMMI? Um, yes. First of all, I want to say whatever we can do, Congresswoman, in terms of pushing that and promoting that bill, I know how cancer has affected you. I know how it's affected me. We will do whatever, because the idea of catching these things earlier and screening through blood tests literally will not only save lives, it will save money as well, too. Yes, absolutely. Let me just say briefly that you would never approve a drug without clinical trials which demands informed consent by a patient. The same thing has to happen at CMMI. 
you can't conduct an experiment when the patient isn't aware and hasn't signed informed consent. And you can't do that without, as I said before, without a smaller test. So the guardrails need to be that you can't just use this as an end run game of a mandatory big model that's going to do whatever CMS wants to do by using its innovation center. We need to put guardrails. So the same way we approach a clinical trial and safety is the same thing that CMMI. And, and once again, I will say, not just to be agreeable, but anything we can do to support that legislation and put guardrails on CMMI and return it to what it really should be as an innovation center, we're behind it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Miller, West Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I yield 45 seconds to Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to bring up one other point. We've talked a lot about cancer. We've talked about a lot of neurologic drugs. Um, the great untold story right now is antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria. In 2019, uh, more people died from antimicrobial-resistant infections than HIV, AIDS, or malaria. So if we're going to continue down this pathway of stifling research, we're going to, where we used to thought penicillin or a quinolone or anything like that, a sulfur drug would take care of things, more and more and more and more people are going to die. So again, uh, a bad consequence of a bad bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. From a state of 1.7 million people, West Virginia has 39,000 people living with Alzheimer's disease. Patients that live in the mountainous rural communities of West Virginia face significant barriers in accessing primary health care, let alone specialized clinical trials. In a 2019 study of one of their clinical trials, WVU's neurology department found that more than 25% of patients had to travel more than 100 miles one way to participate in the trial. Furthermore, patients with neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's, depend on family members or a caretaker to bring them to their clinical trial visits, which only increases the barriers for patients. That's why CMS's national coverage determination for Medicare coverage of the Alzheimer's drug Adahelm and all future drugs in its class is so worrisome. I'm concerned that rural patients won't be able to access an entire class of drugs just because of where they live. Mr. Gonzalez, you touched on the difficulty of having to travel long distances to access tests and studies. Can you tell a little bit some more of the difficulties that patients do face in their ability to participate in these trials? Sure, thank you very much for asking the question. It is uh, extremely difficult. Um, and, I, and I, I'm going to go on a different, kind of different route. Just do it when, quickly. When I have to go somewhere, my wife is with me. So there's two of us each time we're going somewhere. You have costs in travel. You have costs in hotels. Then you have costs in meals. You have costs in what you're going to wear. And then at the end of the day, there's the cost in me. There's what's going to happen to me. Every time I travel, it's about two days to get myself back to normal. It makes you tired. It I, does. I tired and that. cold and shaky. Yes. Um, continuing with the theme of policies which are disproportionately affect rural patients, I'm also concerned about CMMI's accelerating clinical evidence model. This model slashes Medicare payments for drugs approved through the FDA's highly successful accelerated approval pathways until they complete traditional approval. This is entirely nonsensical, and I can't really understand why they do that. Mr. Ocon, Smaller medical providers, including oncology centers in rural areas, typically operate on a very slim margin. Don't you think that this attempt to slow reimbursements of accelerated approved drugs will have a disproportionate impact on these rural providers and therefore their patients? A a absolutely. It's amazing, Congressman Miller, the, the consolidation that impact of federal policy already has had in independent providers and that consolidation, especially in rural areas. So what happens? They close the doors, and then patients don't have access. And the problem is, specifically with this one model, is that, again, it puts, as I've said, it puts providers, us as hostages, in the middle between the government and, and, and the drug company, whether it be the irony negotiation or here, where if a product doesn't have one clinical trial for one indication, they haven't done it properly, they're going to knock down reimbursement. 
and you knock down reimbursement, we have seen this, history has demonstrated it, you not only have cancer clinics, but other providers that close, and as a result, who suffers the most? Patients in rural areas. You're right. And also patients who have, who we I have one more target question. as health disparities. One more question. Yes. Okay. Because you've explained that due to the IRA, drug companies probably won't invest in expanded <coughs> indication research when a drug will be targeted on the government's negotiation. Therefore, this law will certainly limit research and development for new indications. What <coughs> impact does this have on patients, specifically cancer patients? Well, th that's the problem, is we talk about drugs as if they're the same, whereas in cancer drugs, you're talking about different indications developed over the life cycle of the drug. I'm not apologizing for the pharmaceutical industry. We have a problem, as Dr. Murphy said, with high cost of drugs, but the problem is, as you get closer to this negotiation, you would not put funds forward to study a new indication, especially especially indications that deal with pediatric cancers. So you have a real problem in terms of the, the nature of drugs and life cycle development, especially when you talk about cancer drugs, as opposed to drugs that may have just one indication always. Thank you, I yield back. <clears throat> Mr. Fitz Fitzpatrick, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here um, as co-chair of the uh, uh, Bipartisan Cancer Caucus in Congress and also having lost a, a brother to cancer. There's uh, an issue of particular interest to me, uh, which involves the impact that the Inflation Reduction Act will have on the development of future cancer medicines, which oftentimes are small molecule drugs. As you all know, under existing law, small molecule drugs are now subject to price negotiations after nine years. In contrast, biologics will have 13 years. This small molecule penalty, as it has become to be known, uh, will have devastating impacts on the development of new cancer medicines and on other small molecule drugs. Uh, to avoid this crisis, I believe we all must commit to working across the aisle to ensure that small molecules are afforded the same 13 years as biologics are. And I would encourage uh, all, all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this effort uh, today. Uh, my question uh, is for you, Mr. Ocon. Um, are you concerned that if the small molecule penalty remains in place, that it could lead to a halt of new cancer medicines and lead to developers investing more heavily in biologic products instead? I think, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, that logic would dictate that you have a longer uh, time before the negotiation takes place, that you're going to be tilting your investment in biologics, right? Biologics are great. They have done a remarkable, wonderful job in cancer. But the, the, the issue with these small molecule drugs, where they, and I'm not the oncologist here, but where they basically penetrate the blood-brain barrier, they're absolutely essential. So in my written testimony, I gave the example of Imbruvica, a small molecule that's basically been developed over the course of 11 indications over nine years. Nine years is the magic mark. So I think that you're gonna have a tilt to the process, and I think at the very least, you should have 13 years for small molecules. And what do you believe the intent uh, in the IRA was of this disparity between biologics and small molecules? I, I, I just think there's a basic misunderstanding Again, I live in the world of cancer. I think there's a basic misunderstanding of looking at a drug as a drug as a drug, and a small molecule is not as uh, new, innovative, as pronounced as a biologic, but in cancer, they're essential. I mean, right now, we're even dealing with cancer drugs that are, that are in short supply, that are generic drugs that have been used for over 20 years. We're at a crisis point, literally today, we're at a crisis point, so I think that's Part of the reason why. And do you believe uh, that this will undermine uh, President Biden's cancer moonshot goal of reducing cancer death, uh, the, the cancer death rate by half in 25 years? Well, I think in, in, until the cancer moonshot, and I've told this to the cancer moonshot people, become aware of what's happening in not just research and, and development, but what's happening in terms of provider reimbursement, access, consolidation, PBMs, you name it. Until they realize that, you can't just have something that sounds great and innovative as a moonshot without dealing with the reality of our, our total cancer care system. 
Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be uh, working, uh, hopefully, in a bipartisan manner with this committee to address this very issue. Uh, and I'll also be submitting a question for the record on another priority of mine uh, related to the Help Copays Act. Uh, but I'm out of time, so I yield back. Mr. Evans, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Kesselbein, last year Congress and the Biden administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which really will help the American people, including the constituents in Philadelphia. This law is making health care more affordable and accessible to all people, especially in middle income neighborhoods, which I care deeply about. For too long, the American people have been witness to government officials talking about the need to reduce the cost of pres prescription drugs, but little action has taken place. Through the Industrial Reduction Act, we are taking steps to actually reduce the cost of prescription drugs. Two examples. IRA caps Medicare part spending at $2,000 per year. Over, over 57,000 of my constituents are enrolled in this Medicare Part D program. This provision potentially helps thousands in my district save money on needed medication next year. The IRA caps spending on insulin under Part B and D at $35 per month is essentially over 140,000 Medicaid benefits in my home state of Pennsylvania. Can you, this is one question, will you discuss the affordability of these drugs along with the impact on health premium of out-of-pocket costs? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is another very important part of the Inflation Reduction Act, along with the, uh, with the, with the price negotiation part of it. The, the, the parts of the Inflation Reduction Act that uh, lowered out-of-pocket costs for Medicare patients, which uh, because of the extremely high prices for these drugs set by manufacturers in the U.S., because we, don't, we allow manufacturers to set whatever price they want, we get extremely high prices for drugs, and Medicare beneficiaries were paying, uh, especially those, some of those with cancer, were paying enormous amounts out-of-pocket for those products. And so I think it will be a very important step um, to, uh, to reduce those out-of-pocket costs. But I think it is impor also important that the IRA, in addition to that, included um, a process for negotiating drug prices because that can also help reduce the overall spending on drugs that's not just out-of-pocket, but also the spending of that, you know, from, through the, from taxpayers in general on, uh, on the cost of Medicare and Medicaid. Do you have recommendations to address this affordable, affordability con uh, challenge? Sure. I mean, I think that there are a lot of ways to try to address the affordability challenge for prescription drugs. I think the so, so first of all, we need to be making sure that we are uh, prescribing the right drugs. There are many cases where patients are are given um, uh, are prescriptions for brand name drugs when a lower cost brand name drug or a generic drug might be good, uh, just as good for those patients. Um, I think we also need to be thinking about. Um, what reasons that, it, there are, the, that, that there are that why these drugs are so expensive. And one of the reasons that they can be so expensive is, as Congressman Doggett mentioned in his opening remarks, the fact that we allow drug companies to um, obtain dozens and dozens of patents on these products to extend their market exclusivity and prevent timely competition um, from, from other products as well. So I think we need to be thinking about those kinds of issues to try to understand why drugs are expensive and, uh, and, and, to, and to try to figure out how we can ensure um, that patients are prescribed drugs that are, um, that are uh, um, reasonably priced um, and are the correct drugs for them. Um, and then if they are, uh, you know, in cases where there are, it is an expensive drug uh, and there are no other, opportunity, uh, other options for patients, that's where insurance is supposed to come in and, and cover those costs. And that's why I, I think it's useful that we have uh, the, the out-of-pocket caps uh, as, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back, Bounce of my time. This is Tenney in New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, uh, and thank you to our witnesses today. Uh, really appreciate uh, your testimony and your expertise and the, and the time that you spend researching and uh, trying to find cures and and also having uh, Mr. Gonzalez here and I, your family must be so grateful for every minute they have you. So uh, we, we uh, wish you the best and we hope that some of these gentlemen here may be able to help you with research to get you uh, a longer life and a longer life with your family. So you, we, we appreciate you being here because I know it's not easy to do this and sit in front of Congress. But um, 
I wanted, you know, I wanted to just make a couple of comments, and I just, you know, the United States uh, has proven to be the most important health innovation ecosystem in the world. We spend more than any other country uh, by more than 28 percent. I think Germany is the next closest, Canada, Switzerland, and we put, we invest a lot of money into trying to find cures, and uh, a lot of these groundbreaking cures. It's incredible. However. Um, this success, we see these headwinds uh, due to policies enacted under the Biden administration. I, I know the IRA has been brought up many times, but it takes on average right now 3.3 years for treatments approved by the FDA to be covered by Medicare. So, uh, Mr. McElroy, your valley of death discourages innovation, denies new treatments for seniors. While the Trump administration did some work to close the gap, the Biden administration quickly repealed this rule, which we've heard a, a little controversy over today, and is yet to replace it with another alternative in two years. And one of the things that I really picked up on that I wanted to go back and say, we've gone back and forth, and uh, uh, Mr. Okan, you made some comment uh, that is exactly my experience. I took care of both my parents, both with very serious in, illnesses. My dad was uh, a survivor of a dissecting aortal aneurysm, ended up uh, paralyzed, blind, and with multiple organ failure for the last seven years of his life, life but was able to serve. So um, he had a strong life force for sure. But you described something that just made me realize that had he not had a daughter who was a lawyer and someone who could advocate for him, you described a bizarre, convoluted system, PBMs, nonprofit 340B hospitals, high cost of what it is to be out of pocket. This is what I see is like when we over-regulate, and I, I think we should appropriately regulate, tell us what about this over-regulation and why it is preventing us from having innovation, uh, why this is this sort of one-size-fits-all formula. I understand the need to regulate. I think our, our you know big pharma is being said in a negative connotation, but how can we make this so we uh, regulate appropriately while maximizing innovation and understanding the protection for patients? Well, I, I, I will tell you, uh, Congresswoman Tenney, to, to mention two things that you talked about is that, and it's good to see that there is bi bipartisan now awareness that PBMs are a problem. PBMs are fueling drug prices in my world of cancer care. I can't tell you how many times a patient is denied or delayed a drug, a cancer drug, because of a PBM. And, and, and so we have got to do something about PBMs. But I will tell you, and I know it's a, it's a sore topic for some, but we did a study using the hospital's own data, these large nonprofit 340B hospitals. Do you realize that they are marking up cancer drugs, the top cancer drugs, on average five times? Our report is right on our website. It's the hospital's own data. So again, to go back what I said, in my written testimony and my oral, that Dr. Mark Fendrick always says there's a difference between the price and the cost. I'm not apologizing for the pharmaceutical industry. They do dumb things. But the fact of the matter is, it's also the cost. And you walk into some of these big health systems, and you are literally in a cancer drug, having them marked up five times, even a lot greater than that. So th th you, and, and the other thing, we talk about other countries. You don't see other countries with this convoluted system that we have. You don't see PBMs that basically have merged with insurers that are now hiring doctors. United Healthcare owns 70,000 physicians. You don't see this. You don't see hospitals well, marking can I, up like, Can I just reclaim my time for a moment? I want to tell you, I have a friend who's a veterinarian, owns multiple veterinary clinics, and he said it's a lot cheaper to get an MRI for a dog than it is for a human being because there's so much intervention from government, insurance companies, and other non-physician-based groups that have really kind of undermined our system. So I, although they, they all have a role, I just get very concerned about how they've taken control of our healthcare system, and we have lost control, and the innovators and the people that we need to uh, solve the problems that we have to come up with the cures that we need for the future are, are being lost in this PBM. Uh, you name it, every type of, uh, of uh, bureaucracy that is preventing us from uh, from innovating. But I really, I, want, I had a bunch of other questions, but I've, I've run out of time. But thank you so much to all of you, and I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone. Uh, thanks again, and I yield back. Mr. Moore, Utah. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for being here today, witnesses. Um, our capacity for innovation is among one of our nation's greatest assets. Right? We've seen this play out time and time again as we've led the world. Um, in so many different circumstances. 
and you know, I'm primarily speaking of the healthcare sector, obviously, especially today. Disruptors, entrepreneurs, innovators continually enhance patient care and outcomes with new discoveries and developments. Utah, the state where I represent, is home to some of the most creative innovators in the industry, and I really do appreciate the chairman for assembling this group to ensure that America remains at the forefront of medical innovation. Um, a couple questions for, for Dr. Macauer. In your testimony, you mentioned that investors may be hesitant to support innovative medical devices because they may become trapped in the, in the valley of death that my, co that my colleague from, from New York discussed. You know, that period where without Medicare coverage following an FDA approval. It's hard for folks to really wrap their heads around that given that you know, they're both government entities and, and, and the lapse that exists there, right? Um, so how has this situation affected patients who could benefit from potentially life-saving or life-altering novel medicines? Just give us some, your, your thoughts on that. Uh, it's incredibly impactful. Many of these therapies have undergone rigorous clinical trials, um, substantial evidence, uh, ultimately resulting in a rendering by the FDA that their technologies are safe and effective. Um, diseases like heart failure, um, like cancer, uh, diabetes, and in the sense that, let's just take one example, um, continuous glucose monitoring. We all know how tight control of glucose can ultimately prevent very expensive and very devastating side effects, the loss of limbs, um, heart attacks, stroke. Th those types of delays are very significant for patients as they wait for technologies like that to be available. Thank you. Um, it is. It's, it's hard for folks. I mean, they, they think of these organizations as one and the same, and they're, they derive from the same area. They, we have got to be more in sync with being able to, to deliver this care um, to, to these patients. Uh, we've also witnessed the consequences of, of MSIT's withdrawal in Utah. Again, I bring up Utah. Uh, there's a local company with an FDA breakthrough device designation for Parkinson's patients, and it lost a significant amount of funding following the, uh, the, the repeal of, of MSIT. This company has, has struggled to replace the lost funds, and as a result, Parkinson's patients uh, may never have access to a product that could improve their motor function. Uh, my colleagues and I firmly believe that a pathway to MSIT is essential for Medicare coverage of innovative technologies. So I co-led um, a bipartisan bill with Dr. Wenstrup and Congresswomen Del Bene and Sewell to reinstate an MSIT-like pathway. Can you share why a modification of the current coverage pathway is insufficient and why a pathway similar to, to MSIT is needed? Absolutely. I think there's a misunderstanding that when a technology is deemed a breakthrough, it really means that that product has the potential to have a major impact on a debilitating or life-threatening disease. After that designation, then there is a substantial amount of evidence that's necessary to clear FDA. Very few companies actually make it, or technologies actually make it to the FDA approval. Once they have finally crossed that gauntlet to have proven themselves safe and effective with the FDA, especially for breakthrough technologies, that's where the opportunity is to give patients access to it. And, and I think, as evidenced by our, our survey, innovators are very, very w open to continuing to generate evidence development while it is available to patients. And I think that the proposal that's been put forward, which I think is a, a very supportable one, would allow that and give patients access, early access to these therapies as soon as they're available by FDA while continuing to collect any necessary evidence that CMS may require. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, lastly, Dr. Lakdawalla, the Biden administration has, has chosen to, to weaken intellectual property protections for vaccines and is contemplating a similar action for diagnostics and treatments in addition to that. How might this decision adversely affect our long-standing atmosphere of innovation and the future accessibility for the cure of patients? Thank you, Congressman Moore. Um, in general, weaker IP protection we know uh, lowers incentives to innovate simply because it also weakens the rewards for innovation. There is a narrow path for 
the usefulness of intellectual property waivers, but the problem is there's, there's risk on several sides. We know that if waivers are granted solely for very low-income countries, it doesn't have much impact on innovation, and it can have significant impacts on people's health. The problem is that if you waive IP rights in one country, there's the possibility and the expectation that it may happen for other countries that are not low-income countries. And it's that expectation that then can dampen innovation even absent the actual waiver. So it's opening Pandora's box. It's a, it's a possible strategy if there are very tight guardrails that we can do this successfully, but I worry that there are considerable risks when we go down this path. Thank you for your perspective. You're back. You're back. Mr. Davis, Illinois. Thank you, Chairman Buchanan, and thank you, Mr. Doggett. And I want to thank all of the witnesses because this has been a very profound discussion that we've had this afternoon. Mr. Gonzalez, I, I want to simply associate myself with what all of my colleagues have said about your courage, your determination, your advocacy, and the fact that you are with us this afternoon. Your testimony will linger with me for a long time. Thank you, sir. You know, when I think of health care, I really think of the evolution and development that has brought us to where we are. I grew up in the rural South, and most of the people that I knew when I was a kid had no access to real health care at all. There was one physician in the county where I lived. There was no Medicaid and Medicare, which means that most of the people that I interacted with had no way to pay for health care. I also remember that there were no hospitals, and so Hill Burton got passed. Then we were fortunate that the war on poverty got going, the march and the demonstrations, and we got passage of what we called community health centers. And now we have a network of federally qualified health centers all over the nation. And so I call all of these great movement towards where we are. Then we got the Affordable Care Act, that the Obama bill, some people, Obama medicine, and just recently, the inflation reduction. And now we're at a level where we are talking about not just the reduction of cost, but also the continuation of therapies and continuation of, of, of medications that can be helpful. And we subscribe that all of these have been very helpful. Uh, Dr. Kesselham, I was interested in your testimony where you, and I agree with you, that we ought to double the amount of money yeah, that we put into the National Institutes of Health. I believe that you can define the greatness of a society by how well it treats its old, how well it treats its young, how well it treats those who are infirmed, suffer with disabilities, who are described as being disadvantaged. And I was wondering about that. And so if you are not willing to put in the resources that are needed. You know, if you give tax cuts to the wealthy, if you disavow needs for movement, 
does that move us towards where we need to be going? It definitely doesn't. And, and, and I would say that I agree that if you double the NIH's budget, that you would be able to put a lot more money into doing things that the NIH doesn't invest as much money in right now, including trying to ensure that approved drugs are tested in, in populations like elderly patients or children, um, in doing comparative effectiveness studies to test drugs against each other because drug companies refuse to do that because there's, if there's a risk that their particular drug may not, may not win. And so you don't get a lot of those essential tests that would inform physician-patient decision-making around, around those kinds of products. So I think you could move a long way towards the kind of society that you're talking about by providing additional resources that the NIH could then, uh, could then use to invest in those kinds of, uh, of, of, um, of testing to be able to, um, you know, to, to be able to, to understand how drugs work in these, ki in, in, in these kinds of populations to improve disparities in, in, in access to them and in disparities in availability in, in, in the kinds of patients who are enrolled in clinical trials. All of those things are things that with more funding uh, that the, the public infrastructure could, could better do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I must say to you, this has been a great year. Thank you. Thank you, and Thank I you. yield back. Yeah. This is Steele, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all the witnesses for long hours. And thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, that your uh, testimony was just really touching. And I try to understand that what you are going through, but I understand that what your families are going through because my mom was really sick before she passed away with cancer, so I totally get that. Uh, this hearing is extremely important for the constituents I serve and for California's economy. The Medicare coverage of innovative uh, technology pathway to accelerate Medicare coverage for breaking through devices was supposed to be effective on March 15, 2021. President Biden delayed the effective dates numerous times, the first to May 15th, and then until December 15th, and willingly rescinded this rule which would speed up safe and effective new medical devices to Medicare beneficiaries. I am disappointed in President Biden's decision to rescind MKIT, and am frust I am frustrated that it's been taken over two years for the Biden administration to issue a proposed rule for his version, transitional coverage of emerging technologies. As our witness, Dr. Makowar, said in the recent paper, Medicare beneficiaries are more likely to have life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating diseases or conditions. They are more likely to benefit from access to breakthrough technologies that promise more effective treatment or diagnosis. With this in mind, Dr. Makowar, can you share with us a breakthrough example and how it would directly improve patient care? And secondly, could you comment on how rescinding MCAT without a replacement has made it difficult for California's life science community to innovate? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, we've do, just recently done a study on, with uh, actual uh, data from publicly available sources. And in that data set are numerous um, technologies. Many of them do, I'd say a vast majority of them apply to seniors. Um, there are many examples of this. One other example, I've given the uh, CGM example. Um, another example is a technology, let's say, to prevent the uh, likelihood of stroke during certain, certain interventions. Um, I think we can all say that to have a stroke is a devastating thing, and the cost of managing someone who has had a stroke is very expensive to the healthcare system. So there's a long list of these, um, and, um, but I'll go to the next part of your question to answer that one next. Um, certainly patient impact is significant. Um, in California, we have seen a retraction of dollars from investors willing to back these important new therapies. Um, valuations are down, um, jobs are being lost, uh, and most importantly, patients are being impacted. Um, 
I think that there's a reticence, and I teach students and you know, encourage them to go out into the world and invent important solutions. And when they go out and they talk to their colleagues who are actually in the business of doing it and understand how difficult it is and how unlikely it is that they can be successful, they look elsewhere. That's a tragic phenomenon that we must reverse. And I think the key here is to be able to bring your product to market after rigorous testing, once it's validated, but to be safe and effective, to find a way to make it available to patients as soon as possible. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Lakdawala, if I pronounce it right, before I begin, I'd love to recognize you that you are a professor at the University of Southern California and happy that you are here as one of our witnesses. Fight on. Doctor, we have been seeing a 13% increase in bi bioscience industry employment, nearing 335,000 jobs in 2021, and roughly $7 million in R&D expenditure alone in fiscal year 2020. There are roughly 13,000 life sciences establishments in California with $90 billion in output contributions alone in the Los Angeles area, Long Beach, Anaheim. Could you elaborate on how the U.S. International Trade Commission's assessment of a proposed waiver of intellectual property rights for COVID-19 diagnostics and therapeutics at the World Trade Organization could damage California's life sciences ecosystem, could pose national security risk of IP theft by CCP, and how expanding this waiver would threaten investment, research, and development work in our state. Thank you, Congresswoman Steele. I think there are two issues here. One is what actually happens, and two is what could happen. So what actually happens here is the extent to which IP rights are waived will have a chilling effect on investment immediately for the technologies that are impacted. That's a direct effect that we can see. But the other kind of potentially uh, more uncertain and in some ways more insidious risk is that if there is a waiver or if there are, as we see waivers, then that has to be built into everybody's risk benefit calculus in investment. And there has to be an understanding that there's a chance of IP waivers and other disease areas, and that has a chilling effect more broadly outside of the areas where the waivers take place. So that's, I think, probably the bigger risk because that potentially spreads uh, across a wider swath of the life sciences industry, impacting uh, employment and innovation spending in our home state as well as in uh, of firms all over the world. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Smucker, Pennsylvania. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the Chairman for allowing me to participate. I'm not a member of this subcommittee, but it's a, a been a fascinating um, and I think a very important discussion. I'd like to thank uh, each of the witnesses for being here, particularly Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you for your courage and sharing your story. That's, uh, I think, uh, really helpful for us uh, uh, to, to hear your story. I, I can tell you that I've heard from people all across my district who have been in similar uh, circumstances. Um, uh, with Alzheimer's and have seen the devastating impact, uh, but also other diseases. We've been touched in my family by uh, cancer uh, and heart failure, I think someone mentioned. And so all of us, I think, have been, uh, have been impacted. And so I'm not an expert in this area. I'm not a doctor. I don't have a background in healthcare, but uh, knowing the um, value of our system here where we are known across the world as developing some of the best treatments and then seeing some of the potentials that we have. I'm from Pennsylvania, and particularly the southeast part of Pennsylvania, we have a really great um, um, biotech industry and a pharma industry. And we're we talked to a lot of companies that are developing things that could be absolutely life-changing and transformational uh, going forward. And I think someone else mentioned that, you know, to, to people, but also could save a lot of money. And so, I support, have, I've supported after hearing some of these stories, uh, government f uh, funding to help drive some of this. Uh, so for NIH, I've always supported it in uh, research. But I think the really important thing, and I was a business owner, so I understand 
a regulatory system that works well to encourage innovation, and I understand the risk and reward. You have to get that right. And so I get very concerned uh, when we do things that drive down that innovation. It's one of the concerns I had with the IRA. Our, our CBO said that uh, there would be, they estimated uh, 13 less new uh, drugs developed. I think I have that number right. but. Other out, outside, um, uh, 13 fewer cures is what they said, and other outside experts indicated that number could be as high as 135 different cures. Uh, Mr. L uh, Lakdawala, do you agree with those estimates? And then I'm, I have a few other questions that I think are gonna be follow-ups to some of the things that are discussed, but do, what do you think of those estimates? Do? And, and tell me about the impact that will have on people if they are true. Uh, thank you, Congressman Smucker. I, the, the best evidence in the e peer-reviewed economics literature suggests that every $2.5 billion reduction in pharmaceutical revenues leads to one less drug approval. Um, in principle, there are estimated to be hundreds of billions of dollars of lost revenue due to the Inflation Reduction Act, according to the CBO. So one might do the multiplication and see that it's way more than what the CBO forecasts. Now, in fairness, the effect might not be linear, so maybe it's not fair to just multiply in that way. Um, and it's also just difficult to predict exactly what will happen because we are now embarking on a grand new experiment that no country has ever performed. The U.S. is the biggest global engine of innovation, so what we do here has bigger impacts. Uh, yeah, and I, so it will have an impact. I'm concerned I'm running out of time. I do want to get to, there's been um, other questioners uh, have have brought up this uh, difference between traditional accelerated FDA approval. And I just want to understand that um, in her testimony before the Energy and Commerce Committee back in April 26, CMS Administrator uh, Brooks LaShore said that CMS views FDA accelerated approval in a different category that's different than uh, full approval. Uh, what, what does that mean? And uh, in your view, what effect will that have uh, on innovation? Well, I think it's a depressing effect on innovation. I think it's important to think about the rationale for breakthrough approvals in the first place, that it exists because uh, there, there are situations of very high unmet need where the benefit risk calculus is different. When patients have very few alternatives, then it may make more sense to uh, use a technology with more uncertainty. It's and why I supported right to try so much. Exactly. Uh, but uh, should we be thinking in Congress of taking steps to clarify that reasonable and necessary standard? Is that something we should be thinking about? Well, I, I think that standard is very ambiguous. Um, and I think the more that can be done to clarify it for innovators, the better it is for incentives to innovate. All right, I'm out of time again. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is Del Met Benny, California. Washington. Washington. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member uh, for allowing me to join this hearing, um, focus on this important topic on ways we can boost medical innovation. I wanna thank all of our witnesses for taking the time and joining us. It's, um, your, your, uh, your, feedback has been incredibly helpful. My home state of Washington um, is home to many leading medical device companies um, and promising startups that are developing cut it, cutting edge therapeutics and diagnostics, um, Americans battling diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and so many other challenges um, depend on these innovators to develop the next breakthrough technology to improve and save lives. But if we want these medical advances to make a difference, people need to have access to them. And unfortunately, even after the FDA has determined that a breakthrough medical device is safe and effective, it can take over five years for Medicare to cover it. And so we've got to do better for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, that's why I've championed the bipartisan legislation along with um, my colleagues' representatives, Wenstrup, Sewell and more on this subcommittee called the Ensuring Patients Access to Critical Breakthrough Products Act. This bill would create a speedy and predictable pathway for Medicare coverage so that seniors have faster access to the newest cures and therapies while ensuring that these technologies remain safe, effective, and relevant to the Medicare population. Um, 
Dr. McCower, you talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but I wondered if you could discuss how speeding up Medicare approval for breakthrough technologies could actually lead to major cost savings for yeah. Medicare and any examples you might have of that. Absolutely, absolutely, and thank you for your support of that, um, of that bill. Um, the way that you can save money with devices is by avoiding complications. Complications of the disease itself. Um, I gave the example of diabetes, heart disease, very expensive, stroke, extremely expensive. The impact of losing a limb, also tremendously expensive. That in exchange for a device which would allow someone to track their blood glucose in, with more regularity and control to avoid those complications is a very small price to pay for those savings. And just an example of the types of savings that a device could provide to the system if it was able to be covered. Um, and, you know, we're talking about the savings, the financial savings, but clearly in the terms of the impact on patients and quality of life and better outcomes, um, that also may be more qualitative, but incredibly important too. Absolutely right. Um, what types of companies are developing breakthrough technologies from your point of view, and what are the barriers that they face right now? I mean, <laughs> to be a medical device innovator, you face tremendous barriers oh, at one. every Literally step of years, the process. Many of these inventions have never been accomplished before. It requires tremendous courage, um, the ability to convince others, investors to join you on that journey, employees to join you on that journey. And every study, every clinical study, every, every advance, every iteration of the technology is always fraught with risk. Um, then the regulatory process begins, and that's, that can be very long, and it can be very difficult. And the FDA has a fantastic safety record. Um, it's, it's not an easy process to navigate, even if you have a de novo 510K or a PMA, which are categorizations for usually breakthrough technologies. Upon the other side of it, you now have a fully staffed company with the, at, at, per regulations, a full-on team with salaries and jobs, all making sure that that product is going to be produced exactly the same every time and that the data will continue to be monitored and all the reporting requirements to the government. What happens next really matters. If you cannot sell your product, you cannot get that into patients' hands. Obviously, we've talked about the patient impact, but who funds that? Investors have to fund that. And as time goes on, they lose patients, and those companies may go out of business, depriving those those patients of that therapy ultimately. That's why timely, predictable, and you know, speedy access to, to te technology is so important, not only for patients, but really for the innovation ecosystem. Yep, um, and making sure that we look at the, the data and the science behind it to Absolutely. get us there. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, last but not least, Mr. Arrington from Texas. I was worried, Mr. Chairman, you would introduce me as being from California as well. <laughs> <laughs> now that my greatest fear has been say allayed, West I can... Should I shit, say <laughs> West Texas? I don't need any more uh, primary opponents, thank you. <laughs> uh, honored by your presence and your contribution to our discovery and our problem-solving exercise. Let me frame this up a little bit. Uh, in my opinion, America is the laboratory of innovation for maybe many reasons, but two key features are market economy and patent system. Market economy creating value for consumers, primarily through competition, but other elements, and the patent system promoting innovation through protecting intellectual property. Would you nod your head if you agree so far? Okay. Well, the problem is government intervention, at least too much, the wrong kind, can hurt 
the market economy side, and the private sector can, they're very resourceful, uh, can exploit or game the patent side. And that's what I want to focus on uh, for, for the purpose of my question. Um, so, so the patent system is set up to develop or encourage the development of novel products. But you'll have drug companies that will create an original novel product and then they'll apply for a new application, if you will, of the original product. Now the question is, is it truly a new product? But what they will do is build a wall or what they call a patent thicket of patents around, we call it duplicative patents or another name is terminal disclaimers. But it, it becomes this dense wall around this new patent application derivative of the original product. Well, any competitive uh, group with a competitive product to challenge whether or not that innovation is in fact novel would have to go through uh, layers of litigation of each of the duplicative uh, uh, patents. And it is onerous and it is expensive. And if you are the original patent with the new application, you just spend $25,000 on all those patents. Maybe it's a million dollars to litigate each of them. And so maybe your $10, $15 million to protect an extension of what I would call monopoly forces or an exclusive market. We'll never know if that was a legitimate novel development because the competitors don't have the resources to litigate through that packet thicket. Now, I did the best I could to explain what I believe is an, an, a major barrier to innovation because the incentive system in too many cases is for the, for the company, the branded company, if you will, is to spend the money to protect all these patents um, as opposed to invest the hundreds of millions, if not billions, into creating novel value. So the incentive is to do one, which is to prevent competition, anti-competitive monopoly forces, versus the money it takes to develop truly novel innovation. Now, Dr. Lakdawalla, I've done my best to explain that. Do you believe that system exists today? And does that system, in fact, inhibit innovation and ultimately, as a result, limit patient access to new treatment and cures? I yield for your answer. Thank you, Congressman Arrington. I, th I think that, that there are some foundational problems in the way that we price and sell drugs that come to a head in various different ways. And one of the foundational problems is that prices often don't reflect value. And so drugs are rewarded long past when they're actually producing incremental value. And that then creates these kinds of uh, distortions. So I think there's the, the causality is a couple of layers beneath that. Um, I think rewarding drugs for value would also stimulate new entry that results in more creative destruction um, via the entry of new drugs that can compete. Um, I do think that there are a number of issues with biosimilar entry and generic entry that uh, uh, are problematic. We, we overpay for generics. I mean, Schaefer Center research shows, for instance, that Medicare pays more than what consumers pay in cash at Costco. So some of, some of these are quick wins in the way generics and biosimilars function, but I think getting prices right would go a long way towards addressing a number of uh, different symptoms of our various economic diseases in this market. Mr. Chairman, my, my time has expired. You're from Texas, you get an extra 10 minutes. <laughs> I'd like to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. I think it's been very productive. We have received several uh, statements of support for this hearing and ensuring patients have access to innovative therapies without objection. I submit those for the record. Please be advised members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered in writing later. Uh, 
those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the meeting stands adjourned.